Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Uh, welcome to part two of lecture five. Today we are going to clean up some bits from chapter four and make a transition towards chapter five. Chapter five concerns itself with atoms, light, uh, things that glow in the dark. Those things probably will not be on our test, which is this upcoming Monday or around that day. And I'd like to start today by talking about the format of the test so you guys know what to expect. Uh, today, for our office hours after lecture, we will not be doing a, a typical five problem homework set, but we will instead be doing practice problems that are almost identical to the questions that I'm going to ask you on the test. That will be an important training session. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I was telling either you or my other class, I can't remember who, uh, when we solve problems together up to now, you guys are kind of watching me set it up and you're watching me solve it and you're kind of, I hope, learning how a pro would solve it and you will adapt to some of those habits. But it's a totally different thing to watch someone do it and then to have to do it on your own. That's like a whole different level of crazy. So I think you're going to find that it's a little more stressful than you anticipated when there's no tour guide. And for that reason, it's going to be a good idea for us to practice uh, solving the problems as if we were in the test. Rather than me just walk you through a problem, today I'm going to pose a question uh, during office hours, <clears throat> and then I'm just going to give you five or 10 minutes in your own personal hell to see what you can do. How far could you get without my help? Uh, you'll probably find that many times you, you'll have a stumbling block or, or a roadblock that you can't overcome. After 10 minutes of really having to thrash around on it, then we'll talk about how you would have solved the problem. And hopefully you will learn how these things should be done. That's my hope. Um, so that'll be an important training session for you guys. Uh, let's talk about the format of the test and what days it will be open. So the exam uh, is open for three days and you can take it any time during those three days. I'm doing this because I discovered that last semester, uh, <clears throat> I only had it open for one day, which was Monday, and that caused some stress for some people. Some people couldn't start until late, and uh, then they needed some rest or something, or some people had more free time on a Sunday than on a Monday. So <clears throat> I'm going to make the exam active the way that your homework is uh, for three days. Uh, and you can take it any time from Sunday up until Tuesday, let's say at, you know, 11.59 p.m. I don't know what time I'll activate it Sunday, hopefully early enough for those early birds out there. Maybe I'll even do it Saturday night, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> and the test is 100 questions. So that's gonna take a little bit of time to do, okay? They are multiple choice. With options ranging from A, B, C, D, or E. So if worse comes to worse, you have a one in five chance, which is a 20% chance of guessing any question correctly without knowing any astronomy, if you just click the buttons. So for those of you out there who can't hack it, who can't hack watching the videos, reading notes and trying to learn, then click the buttons and get your 20%, okay? <laughs> no matter what, you will get through that test. Um, you don't wanna get a zero. Uh, there are three parts to the test. The first part uh, is a part with diagrams. So in the diagram section, there will be a picture of something we've seen during our course. And uh, that picture will have different questions labeled on it. Maybe uh, this will be number one, and that will be number two, and that will be number three, and then something else will be number four, and something else will be number five. And then for the next five questions, you will identify the appropriate parts of the diagram 
with the appropriate astronomical term. This is something between do you understand a picture to do you understand some vocabulary terms? Um, <clears throat> there's going to be something like, I don't know, maybe either five picks uh, uh, times six questions, or maybe there'll be six pictures times five questions. Roughly, there'll be about 30 points worth of your test in diagrams. This is supposed to be one of the easier parts of the exam. Of course, <laughs> since I won't be policing you during the exam, because that's not something I'm interested in doing, you will have every piece of information you can scrounge up at your disposal, from your notes to your book to the internet. So I'm guessing this is going to be particularly easy this year. Um, and I think that's OK, because I think you'll be spending time with the material and you'll be learning reinforcing those concepts. So I think there will be some value for that. After all, life these days is stressful enough without having to make things more stressful, OK? This should be an easy part of the test, but who knows? You might get a few wrong. Um, the second part of the test, I'm running out of room already here, uh, will be kind of general. Uh, so that's let's use Roman numerals here. So that's part one of the test. Part two of the test is sort of uh, general multiple choice questions about things that we've covered in this class. These can be in the form of definitions. They can be in the form of conceptual questions. There could be small math involved, like maybe you have to multiply a number here or there. But in general, in general, these are non-math type questions. And if you're looking for an example of what a question like that could be, uh, consider that homework problem we had where, uh, where you were asked, suppose the moon was twice as far from Earth as it is today. Would a total solar eclipse still be possible? That's the kind of conceptual question that relies on understanding the concepts from the course, but doesn't involve doing a calculation. Like I said, there might be a few that are little teeny mathy stuff. And there's lots of stuff I can ask you with celestial coordinates, lost at sea types of things, although probably a, a proper lost at sea problem would be in the third section. Uh, oh, how many of these will there be? Uh, if everything goes according to plan, roughly 30 points. And that leaves 40 points left for the mathematics section. The third section is the sort of application math questions. These are very much like the, the mathematical type questions we do for homework. And that's going to be our guide. And there'll be 40 points worth of this. And the questions that I'm going to be asking you are going to be variations on the homework questions that you've done with me up to now. So the way they'll be structured is there'll be a box with some givens. Maybe I'll tell you um, the uh, synodic period of Neptune is dot, dot, dot. And then I'll tell you some other things about Neptune. Maybe it's eccentricity or it's period, or, or, or I guess I already said synodic period, some other things that you might want to know. And then you'll be asked uh, a set of questions on them. So 61, 62, 63, 64, and 65 will all be based on the givens that you had inside the box. And the idea is that I would take a typical long homework problem and break it up into kind of parts, right? In the first part, you probably, uh, oftentimes, the way this goes is you might just need to convert some units. So just by knowing how to do dimensional analysis well, you're going to rack up some serious points, OK? So you'll convert some units. In the second question, you might need to do something. You might need to find the sidereal period. And that will require you to go on a formula hunt and try to jam things into a formula and see if you can make it work. And then the third question will be a follow-up. I did design it intentionally so that if you can't do the first couple questions, it will mess up the others sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. And that's for real, because at this point, if you cannot do dimensional analysis, you're not my friend, OK? That's how I feel. That's how personal it is to me. You're not my friend anymore, and you never were my friend if you can't do dimensional analysis. So you better be able to do that. I'll be testing you on that uh, uh, come 
come uh, office hours today. Uh, so I really hope you know those four steps of dimensional analysis. Anyone who does not had best go back and watch that video and take those notes down and practice, okay? And I will help you practice today. Uh, there's a formula sheet. You guys already have the formula sheet. Raise your hand if you have the formula sheet already. Ian, Ian, what you doing to me, buddy? Zachary, Zachary raised his hand in the shadows there. Okay. I forgot that you guys could do that. That's cute. Uh, uh, Ian, what's going on? Talk to me. <clears throat> I, it sounds familiar, but I just off the top of my head, I, well, like, are, I think did I, you tell me that you sometimes watch the video from Monday after the Wednesday class? Is that what yeah, you Well, yeah, well, yeah, usually because I have classes that take up a lot of time on Monday and Tuesday. Okay. So, I end up doing so, in, so in this case, me opening the exam on Sunday would probably be very helpful for you. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So, so that um, I'm going to send it to the class one more time, but I did send it to your emails. So if you look at the emails for me, uh, it should be in there. Hold on a second where I try to find. Uh, I'm uh, just so that you have it. I think you guys should start practicing today during this session. So what I'm going to do, uh, just give me a second here, is I'm going to send you again. I did this last time, but I have just sent to the chat log the formula sheet. Those of you who are watching the video later can just look up the email, but I sent it to Ian so he could have it. And uh, <clears throat> awesome, good. Thank you, Paul. And 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 let's just kind of look at that uh, together. Can I go to the chat log too? Can I do this? Okay. Can you guys see this screen here? Can you see the, the equations? All right. So notice all the equations that we've seen so far are on here. Not only that, I've even given you unit conversions. For those of you who still don't know what a kilo is, it's a thousand, okay? But if you forget, well, or if you, I mean, think about it, you have your whole notebook with you. Like, so I'm even saving you time looking up in your notes. I don't know what else I could do except come and make you a sandwich while you take the test, for God's sakes, okay? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> Here's something I don't give you that you kind of have to know from context. The units aren't really specified. And I kind of did that for a reason. I kind of want you to know what the units are. I want you to know that some are MKS units. I want you to know the units of P and A in P squared equals A cubed. Of course, if you can't remember things, I suppose you could go hunt around your notes and look it up. But what ends up happening is with a long 100 question test, it's gonna be a multi-hour slog. I kind of designed it so it would take up the sort of same window of time that a lecture plus a lab takes up, right? And and I did that intentionally. Why? Because I'm not one of these teachers that gives you a quiz every week. I'm not constantly harassing you. I'm going to do it to you twice, once halfway through the semester and once at the end. I think two horrible exams is better than death by a thousand cuts. You can decide yourself once you've had this class which you like better. Okay. Before I move on to talking about materials, so the, oh, uh, one last thing. You might have a question, what chapters or what material is gonna be on it? Everything we've done today up and in including to today's lecture, right? That should be, in my opinion, kind of obvious. Uh, I really doubt that anybody reads the book. That's my suspicion. But let's say there is someone out there who's crazy enough to read books uh, these days. Then uh, from the book, the chapters that it will cover uh, is chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, special chapter S1, chapter four. And today is a bit of a transition between four and five. Uh, the material from today is actually more in chapter four. Today is gonna be about momentum and energy and temperature. I might get into atoms a little bit. Maybe I'll throw some atom stuff in there. So maybe just it'll cover up to whatever I cover today. If I find any questions in the test that I didn't cover, I'll try to mute them and your test might be out of 99 points instead of 100, we'll see. But other than that, just crash your way through it as best you can. You do not have to get a 100 on this test. You will not get a 100 on this test. I designed my test so that you could not get a 100. I mean, I think it's fair. All the questions I ask are stuff that we've done in this class, but it's astrophysics, right? It's not supposed to be easy. Um, but you don't need to get a 100 to get a great grade in this class. All you have to do is not be a flake, 
take the test and do your best. And getting even a 50 out of 100 is a perfectly respectable grade, believe it or not, on my exam. And as long as you're doing your homeworks in your labs, you'll still end up with a great grade, okay? There will be a gentle curve at the end of the course once we mix it all together. So that'll help you guys a bit. The only thing you could do wrong is not take the test. And no one I think here would be crazy enough to do something like that, right? I really don't wanna to have to get an email from someone being like, ah, oh, I, I just, what's going on? I forgot that we were having a test, you know? That would be bad for you. <laughs> that won't be bad for me, it'll be bad for you. Okay, so I just wanna make that clear, you know, so we avoid unpleasant confrontations. Uh, do you guys have any questions now that I've said my piece about all this? Is there something that you'd like to know? Or did I cover? I covered. Um, so I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not, but you said that you could take like breaks during the test because there are so many questions. Yeah, exactly. And and that's one, another reason why I gave her three days. You know, uh, one person who was a great student that I had last semester, they just had a lot going on and 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 they got tired and fatigued. And and I think building in that ex that three day window will help for that thing. Now, here's what I think the deal is. Once you take the test, you kind of have to leave it open in your browser. I'm not exactly sure because I kind of am still new to Blackboard like many of you are. I made the multiple choice test and I tried to give you the option that you had an unlimited, I, I put no time limit on it. So I think as long as you keep it open, you can work on the test. And then when you're ready to submit it, you submit it. So if you want to have some Cheerios, 30 questions in, that's fine. The only penalty will be you'll just drag it out longer, but that's, I actually think you probably should take a break from time to time and, you know, carb up or whatever you do. Uh, so I think you can just work on it for those three days until you're ready to submit, which, which will be good for you guys, right? Do budget your time correctly. I wouldn't want to start this at like Tuesday at 10 p.m. That would be stupid. <laughs> uh, maybe try and knock it out on Sunday or Monday. Oh, here's the other thing. So the, the one thing I'm, I'm trying to try different this year, last year in a test, I usually treat my tests like a full contact sport. Uh, when we had class together, I liked being in the room with you and I liked walking around. And if I saw someone just really frustrated or about to snap their pencil and lose their mind, maybe I'd give them a little hint, a passive aggressive hint or something. And I liked being around for questions if someone felt really stuck. Last year, I tried to just like have us all log in at the same time and all mute our video. And I was just kind of hovering around the background, but it kind of didn't work so well for me because I, not that many people were asking questions and the actual number of you that show up to live lecture is actually a pretty small fraction of the class. Like right now we have, what is this? Four uh, by three, uh, 12, 13. We've got 14 people that typically show up and I think there's like 84 in the class or something, right? So I think rather than me doing that, I'm just gonna let myself off the hook in terms of a, and people are gonna take it at all wacky times, but I will be available for questions anytime, day or night. There's no, uh, yeah, I know Paul. And Paul, I've got two of them. I've got like 160 students, Paul. That's a lot of damn people to keep track of. And that, I think probably the best way to do things is you guys just take the test whenever you take it. And if you get in a jam, you can email me or you can even call me or text me. It's a modern world and I'm okay with that, uh, you know. You guys know that that's uh, my email because many of you do email me. And I'm not afraid uh, to give you the, my number. You can just text me or call me and uh, I'll probably, <clears throat> I'll do my best. The only thing I'm not good at is early morning stuff. So I, if I am awake, I will, I will attempt to answer you. <laughs> But as you guys know, I'm more, uh, astronomers stay up all night. I went into this business for a reason, okay? I'm not a morning person. But I, if I can wake up, because if I'm capable of hearing the buzzer or something in my half asleep way, I will do my best to answer your question. So it can't hurt to try and I'll get back to you at some point as soon as I can. But I gave you that number because probably when you're working on the question, then you're really like, you have the burning question that you have to answer right then. So this would be a fast way to get in touch with me by text or by call, and I'll try to troubleshoot it. 
So uh, that's that's me trying to be uh, available for you guys. Um, and if you're just joining us, Jonathan, I just went over the, the format of the test, the number of questions and such, okay? Um, okay, I'll watch that. Yep, watch that later. I think uh, the most important thing, hide non-video participants, let's get rid of the trolls. The most important thing you need to know for now, Jonathan, uh, besides the stuff that you can watch later is you have anywhere from Sunday until Tuesday to take the test. So I, I, Jonathan, I think you join us on Wednesdays, but like Ian, you have more stuff going on on Mondays or do I have that backwards? I can't. Uh, no, Wednesdays, I have a lot of stuff going on. So I join on Wednesdays for lunch and then I have to like remove serial track parts and parts and yeah, it's fun. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> like putting together an engine or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so, but, but you'll have anywhere from Sunday to Tuesday. So those of you who like to crank out some work on Sunday or if Monday's a free time for you, great. Just by Stop Tuesday, uh, by the way, one of the reasons the cutoff is Tuesday is I need to submit midterm grades on Wednesday and I need a little time to do the calculation, right? So by Tuesday night, I kind of need those done. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so at this point, we should probably move on to some lecture stuff unless you guys have any other questions that I might not have addressed. Anything else, uh, Nori? All right. Cool. All right. Well, let's return to some concepts from last time. Uh, I'm going to erase all this. Okay. Um, I want to talk about some physics concepts that are actually related to Newton's laws of motion. But what they really are is kind of a gateway drug that's gonna bring us into the world of radiation and atoms and light. And the concepts I wanna to address today are the concept of momentum. I wanna spend a lot of time talking about energy. I wanna talk about power luminosity, they're kind of the same thing. And I at some point want to get around to talking about temperature and heat. We'll see if I can get all of those concepts in today, but that would be ideal. And if I finish uh, all that early, maybe we'll do a little bit on atoms. So these are the this is the goal for today. Uh, these are all kind of like little modules. So they're going to be kind of compartmentalized. We'll start with momentum first uh, because you will remember that Newton's version of Kepler's second law is the same as Kepler's second law. Let's pretend that's a test question. What is Kepler's second law of planetary motion? That could be a test question. Who knows? It is the law of areas. A planet sweeps out equal units of area in equal intervals of time. Excellent. The law of areas. A planet sweeps out equal units of area in equal intervals of time. And uh, let's just, uh, okay, whatever. Uh, uh, sorry, I've, I've moved my, I keep moving my tool, my taskbar all over the place. Uh, I just, come on, buddy. Oh, I see your faces are blocking me. There we go. Uh, I just want to have a picture to drive this point home. Uh, so just bear with me, guys. I'm struggling. Here we go. Okay, so function F570. This is a nice illustration of the law of equal areas. You can see that there's a line connecting the planet and the sun and that the planet is not moving at a uniform speed. It moves much faster close to the sun at perihelion and slower at aphelion. However, if you make a line between the planet and the sun and you keep track of the area the planet sweeps out, that remains constant. The area of this long skinny triangle is equal to the area of this short squat triangle. Why is this law useful? This law gave Kepler and friends predictive power. Predictive power makes you kind of like a wizard or a magician. You can say the planet will appear in your sky Tuesday at 9 p.m. 
And then when it shows up, you look awesome, right? It makes it sound like you know what you're talking about. People tend to trust you when you say something and then it comes true. Um, so, so the law of equal areas lets you figure out how long it will be until the planet reaches what we might call quadrature at position L. You'll also remember that Newton found that this law did not need any modification. It was true, but that the mathematical analysis he did showed him that it was true for a reason, and the reason was the conservation of angular momentum. It turns out that the conservation of angular momentum is a key concept in astronomy because lots of things in this solar system are rotating. You're on a rotating planet, a spinning planet, which is also rotating around the sun. The sun rotates around the galaxy. All the planets are spinning around in a disk. So before we can talk about angular momentum, we have to start by learning about linear momentum, okay? So conceptual break. Let's have a discussion of linear momentum. It's a physics concept that comes from Newton's laws of motion. For some reason, historically, in science, we give it the letter P. I think we've used M for too many things at this point between mass and uh, I don't know, other things have M in it. Linear momentum gets the letter P. And it has a mathematical dish definition. The momentum of a moving object is its mass times its velocity. And uh, in a touchy-feely kind of way, I like to think of linear momentum as the oomph of a moving object. Linear momentum tells you the oomph of a moving object. Why is it is important to physicists and astronomers is it's an example of something called a conserved quantity. And what a conserved quantity means in physics is it means that the total momentum in a closed box in a closed system is always a constant number. And that means you can analyze problems, for instance, colliding objects, and you can predict what will happen in the future. Here's the deal with things like momentum and energy and, and power. <clears throat> These quantities are by nature a little bit more abstract than something like velocity or acceleration. We tend to really understand distances and we understand time and we understand speeds well because that's part of our everyday life from running on a track to measuring the length of time of a lecture. Something like momentum, you have to work a little bit harder for. It's, it's less tangible and seeable. But if you're willing to think about it, you get deep insight like a magician into physical problems. And momentum is one of those things. So where would you see momentum in your everyday life? Well, let's take something that I was doing last night, playing a game of pool, okay? And you guys know, uh, if I've uh, spent any time playing pool, that that when you when you fire the cue ball at one of the other billiard balls, whether it's an eight ball or uh, the 13 ball or whatever, usually what happens during the collision is the first object comes to rest and motion is transferred to the second object. And what we say here is that this first object had momentum. It had a mass times a velocity. And when, when the cue ball hits the second ball, it comes to rest. The second ball picks up the motion and momentum is transferred between the two. And the momentum is constant. The original momentum was the velocity of this ball times its mass. This one had no velocity. So the velocity that the yellow ball will pick up will be equal to the velocity of the cue ball if they have roughly the same mass. This is just one type of, uh, one type of collision you can analyze in momentum. Uh, the three conditions that you usually find when you analyze collisions is you can have both objects have the same mass, which is the situation we were just looking at. Usually what happens, ah, actually, it's kind of what happens in this thing. I thought I had shown you guys this, but you've probably seen this little cute office toy before, right? You guys know what they call this? Let's see, can I angle my camera? They call this uh, Newton's cradle, right? 
Uh, hold on, I'm looking for a little box or something. Something to stand this on. Uh, I, I know. How about a big old book? Uh, no, I can't do that because that will hit all the buttons. All right, I'll just hold it. There we go. So you guys have seen how Newton's cradle works, right? You can pull back one of these balls and you can transfer momentum. This would be a lot cooler if I wasn't holding it. It's gonna shake. Okay, here we go. So momentum gets transferred like a magical fluid between all of the spheres in the middle and it creates and imparts motion to the one at the end. It's really nice to be. Here's another one you can you can sometimes pull two back, right? And then you can even sometimes do uh, I like this one too, right? Where you All of these are examples of the conservation of linear momentum. Kind of neat. In collisions, usually you find one of three conditions. Sorry, let me see if I can get this camera angle back here. Okay. So one condition, the condition you just saw, is when the spheres have equal masses, usually one object comes to rest and all of the momentum is imparted to the other. That's kind of magical. Uh, the other two conditions you can have is that of the bowling ball and the BB, right? If a BB collides with a bowling ball, when you analyze the momentum of the collision, a BB will usually not impart too much momentum to the bowling ball. It will just ricochet off and bounce in the other direction. That's when the initial object has a small mass. The other collision type is if a bowling ball hits a BB. It usually just, this object has so little mass that it just snow plows it and carries it along. But because the momentum of the system is conserved, you can analyze collisions between any two objects, and if you know what their initial velocities and masses are, you can usually predict what will happen after they collide, which is pretty wild. They use this in particle accelerators to find new hidden particles like uh, pi mesons and quarks. Also, the people who analyze car crashes to figure out who is at fault use these kinds of uh, collisions. In general, people tend to have a pretty good intuitive understanding of linear momentum. Uh, however, anytime things begin to rotate, concepts like momentum and force, they all take on a new twisted dimension. Rotation is inherently complicated. Rotation actually adds hidden accelerations that you wouldn't think were there. And anyone who's been on one of those um, amusement park rides where you feel pinned to the wall knows that funky things happen when you start to uh, rotate. There is a corresponding concept called angular momentum, and let's take a look at that next. This is the one that's really important for astronomy purposes. Very, it's very rare that things collide in astronomy because space is so big, and it's just, you really have to have two things on a perfectly head-on uh, direction for them to collide with each other. Let's talk about angular momentum. In physics, we give angular momentum the symbol L, okay? And the angular momentum of a system is defined as the mass times the velocity times the radius of orbit. And our sort of classic setup of angular momentum, if you had to have the most generic picture possible, it would be something like this. You, are, you have a, a, a little uh, ping pong ball on a string and you're spinning it around in a circle. It has a radius of orbit r, a mass, and a velocity. And if you multiply all those things together, we define that as angular momentum. Um, angular momentum is a conserved quantity, just like linear momentum. And what that tends to mean is it tends to mean something like this. Objects that rotate want to stay rotating and in the same direction. Okay. 
in some ways, it's it's sort of related to Newton's law of inertia. Uh, objects that rotate want to continue to rotate, and they want to keep the same direction. How does one define the direction of angular momentum? It's a bit of a tricky problem because, uh, unlike in linear momentum, directions the direct momentum has a direction associated with it. But if you have a particle, and that particle has linear momentum, it has a direction of motion then it's obvious the direction of motion is in the direction the particle is moving. But things get a little bit weirder when you're rotating in a circle, because at one moment, the direction of the ball is towards my red arrow. When the sphere is over here, its direction will point like so. And when it's here, it will point like so. And as you can see, as you rotate around in a circle, the direction of the particle is constantly changing. There is something that does not change. And that something is the axis of rotation. So weirdly, we define the direction of angular momentum to be the axis of spin because it's the one thing that stays constant in a rotating system. And angular momentum, its conservation, has some buggy effects, which I will attempt to demonstrate now. Here's a spinning system. It's a bicycle wheel. And if I give it a twist, I can impart some angular momentum to this system. Now, this is just a normal old fashioned bicycle wheel with a with a, a spoke or sorry, a, a handle in the center. And I've got a string attached to one side so that I can hold it up by one of the arms. You'll notice when the bicycle wheel. Uh, hold on, let me. I just don't want to smash my apartment to bits here. When I hold this up when it's not rotating, gravity just kind of torques on it and pulls it over and it kind of flops over like so. But now let's see what happens when I give it a bit of angular momentum. Let me adjust this down here. So let's give this thing a good healthy spin. Now I can hold the bicycle wheel by the string and gravity is unable, unable to pull over the wheel. And that's because of the conservation of angular momentum. In fact, watch, even if I try to knock it over, I'm unable to do so. I can't even push this thing over if I tried. You will notice, however, now to explain what's going on here is pretty wild. Do you see how it spins around in a circle? This is a motion called precession. Its, precess its precession is similar to what happens with Earth. And the, the analysis of this is pretty interesting. Gravity is trying to torque and pull this thing down the fact that angular momentum wants to be conserved makes it wants to keep spinning in that direction. And the end up resultant motion is for it to twist around and go into this processional motion. This is why you don't fall over on your bicycle when it's in motion. Have you ever thought about that? The only time you fall off your bicycle is when it's stopped. You're actually held aloft on your bicycle by the conservation of angular momentum. And we use this in all kinds of different applications. This is the principle of how a gyroscope works, okay? Um, People on the segways, those ridiculous things, they've got a little gyroscope in there to keep it upright. In space, we use gyroscopes to point telescopes. The Hubble Space Telescope has these gyroscopes and you can use a motor to spin them up and spin them down and it will cause them to twist direction. It's actually very, just like if this is spinning at a constant rate, it will undergo a precession. You can actually accelerate and decelerate it um, to, to, to change the direction of a telescope in space. Uh, a very cool version of this demo, one that I would like to do, but I'm a little terrified of, is you can sometimes, you can see the surprising ways in which, and <laughs> I can't believe I'm even contemplating this right now. <laughs> All right, so, uh, if you put a professor on a spinning stool, you can sometimes, transfer momentum to the professor from the rotating bicycle wheel. And uh, let's see here. Am I feeling crazy enough to try this today? <laughs> this is where we're really going to get into some super bloopers. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. Okay. I don't know. It's Wednesday. I feel like goofing around. Let's see if we can do it. Um, <clears throat> Am I going to watch you like kill yourself on this thing right now? <laughs> I think I'll be all right. We'll see. All right. So I've got, I can spin. All right. So we'll give this thing. I can't remember exactly. Woo. 
Do you see how I can change the direction? Look at that. Just by twisting the bicycle wheel, I can cause myself to rotate back and forth. Um, all right, that's as much as I dare do because <laughs> I can't believe I even pulled that one off. Did you see how I started to rotate every time I turned the direction? Isn't that weird? You're just changing the orientation of the spin and to conserve angular momentum, it causes me to twist around. I wasn't doing that. It was, it was just the conservation of angular momentum. You know why I love the conservation of angular momentum? Because it's like magic, right? It's weird, funky things happen that you would not normally be able to predict that they're surprising results. And as you can imagine, let me get back into position here. Angular momentum is all around us in our solar system. In fact, angular momentum is the reason why the solar system flattened into a disk in the first place. It's the reason why spiral galaxies are shaped like a disk. Let's see if you guys can understand Kepler's second law in terms of angular momentum. So let's go to our slide again. And uh, I don't remember what the number, oh, the number was like 70, function F570, is that right? Yeah, cool. Okay, so how does angular momentum come into play here with the law of equal areas? Can you see what's going on? We know that the product of mass times velocity times the radius of orbit needs to be a constant, right? That's a fixed number. So how does that change the speed of my planet as it goes around the sun? Is it because the radius is always changing? That's right. So Paul, we can see that the radius or the so-called moment R here at perihelion is shorter than the radius at aphelion. Now, I didn't do a good job uh, with those letters. Let me try text, okay? So we know that mass uh, times, do I have a better times button? I guess I don't. We'll just use that for now. Mass times velocity times radius is a constant value, right? So, uh, oh, I wish I had moved that. Anyways, Paul G is pointing out that the radius, when it goes from aphelion to perihelion, is shrinking. We probably can't change the mass of the planet. That's fixed. But if angular momentum is to be conserved, the velocity has to increase as the radius shrinks. In other words, what's happening here is the planet speeds up at perihelion to conserve angular momentum. You know, this is one of the reasons why stars never really collide in a galaxy. It's just so hard to make things collide because of the conservation of angular momentum. Unless your velocity is dead on pointing straight at the sun, if you're even just a little bit off, gravity and the conservation of angular momentum will cause you to kind of slingshot off of the planet. It's actually quite difficult to get things to collide in space. Um, and that's true actually for the world of atoms as well. Electrons don't crash into the nucleus of an atom too often because they have too much angular momentum. Okay. Um, angular momentum is something that I'm gonna wanna make reference to from time to time. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, planets and moons in our solar system. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. May I erase any issues? Okay. Let's talk about another magical quantity. Let's talk about energy. And I want to just check and see how I'm doing on time here. Bad as usual. All right. <clears throat> um, energy is another abstract conserved quantity. And it's something that we're going to want to spend a lot of time talking about in this class, all right? So you hear people say, oh, I've got a more energy efficient car. I have an energy efficient house. But what is that energy? Well, the fundamental definition of energy is so subtle, so sublime, that it's actually not helpful to learn it. Not at first, anyways. The definition of energy in its most abstract form is that energy is a force multiplied by a distance. And while this is true, while this is the fundamental and most basic definition of energy, at your stage of development, uh, it's not helpful. 
you almost have to understand energy already before this formula can make any sense. So let me tell you some things about energy that are good to know when you start off. Um, energy, like momentum, is a conserved quantity. That means the total energy in a system, and that system could be the molecules of gas in an oven, it could be uh, bumper cars uh, in, in a ring, the total energy in a box is constant. And what I tried to impress upon you with my recent Daring Do demos was that conserved quantities can have unpredictable results. Well, actually, I want to say it the other way. You can actually predict things that are surprising by knowing that the total energy of a system is constant. This makes a quantity very useful to a scientist. Energy also takes various forms, various surprising forms. And just like with Newton's cradle here, where almost it seems like there's this magical ghost-like substance being transmitted through the system, energy can be transmitted from one form into another with some surprising results. The general class of forms that energies can take are one, potential energies, potential energy is usually the energy that's stored in some kind of a force field. I don't want to start sounding too Star Trek on you guys just yet. So why don't I just say it's stored energy because that will be less threatening to you. Okay. So this is energy that's stored in a system. The truth is that energy is stored in force fields. But that's an abstract concept we could get to at a different time. Um, there's another class of uh, energies called kinetic energies. Oops. Kinetic energy is usually associated with moving objects. bullets or missiles or aeroplanes. And then lastly, there's a third form of energy, which is one that we really want to talk about. And that's light. Light itself is sort of a pure form of energy. And what's so cool about light is light has aspects of potential energy, but also aspects of kinetic energy. Because it doesn't neatly fit into either one, it kind of takes its own beast-like form. In fact, if the universe did begin in a Big Bang, we might even imagine that all of the energy of the universe was at one point in the form of light. There's a lot of interesting questions to consider there. We're going to start by analyzing a particular type of potential energy, gravitational potential energy. That's a good place for us to begin. Uh, Jenna, how are you doing on those notes there? You got all that stuff? Yep, I'm all set. Thank you. All right. I'm going to erase objectors. OK, so you learned the basic definition of energy. I was obliged to tell you that. Sorry, I moved this thing, and now I can't, I can't get back to my sweet spot here. OK, let me just a moment, guys. Let's talk about gravitational potential energy. All right, gravitational potential energy is energy stored in a gravitational field. One of the simplest forms that's easy to understand is to imagine picking a kilogram mass, some kind of massive object, and lifting it off the ground up into the air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a massive object, all right, and I'm going to, this is the ground, 
and I'm going to pick it up some height h above the ground, and I will store gravitational potential energy. The equation to describe it is mass times little g times h. Okay, here's where I need you guys to remember some things. Tell me what you know about little g. And please tell me you know something about little g, or I'm going to make every single test question about little g. It's a constant that equals 9.81 meters per second. Oh, wow. Tickle me with your three sig figs there, uh, Paul G. Or Paul G, I kind of, I'm a kind of low precision guy. I like 10. And what are the units again, Paul? That matters even more, really. Meters per second, second. Uh, meters per second squared. Meters per second squared. And Paul, do you remember the name of this thing? This thing has a name. Uh, acceleration of gravity? Yeah. Sometimes known as the local acceleration of Earth's gravity. And we talked about that uh, in this class, I believe, a, a couple of times, right? We had some discussion about this. Mass times little g times h. Let's go ahead and let's make some gravitational potential energy. So um, <clears throat> I've got a one kilogram test mass, okay? Put it on the ground. Let's see, what did I have for breakfast today? I actually had some chicken wings. I was a little indulgent this morning, okay? And um, so I had some chicken wings and I, I gave my muscles some energy, some chicken wing energy, all right? And here I go, I'm going to fight the forces of gravity and I'm gonna create me some potential energy. Here I go. And here it goes. Two meters above the ground. Uh, okay, I only have two hands. So I, I lifted that up from the ground to about two meters. And now I have created some energy. That's the kind of thing I do for my students. I create magical energy every day in this class. Now, where is the energy, by the way? I've stored some energy in a gravitational field. Where's the energy hiding? I don't see any energy down there. I don't see any energy up here. Where's the energy? Wouldn't it be in the kilo? Not exactly, Ian. It's not that simple that it's that it's in the mass. But that would be your first thought, that somehow the energy was in there, right? Like being applied to it, I guess. It's like on it. I don't know how to. Um, the only way I, I, I deliberately asked this question because it's a weird question that kind of doesn't make any sense. But it's a question you could ask. Um, the only real correct answer, uh, Ian, is that it's kind of contained in the system. And the system is the ground plus the height H, the space, plus the mass. So this is important. It's not hiding in there. It's not hiding in there. There's nothing in between it. But the entire system stores the energy. See, because once I've stored this energy, Ian, I can do something with that energy. I could take this over to a small village in an impoverished section of the world, and I could deploy the payload on some unsuspecting villagers, and I could release the energy uh, on their heads. Okay, so maybe that wouldn't be necessarily a you know a humane use of energy, but we could do it that way, and it does happen all the time. Uh, you can do things with that stored energy. Here's another way to look at it. Um, I have a question. Okay. It might be really stupid though. What? Like, it okay. might be really stupid though. Um, wouldn't you be releasing like obviously like you're releasing the energy because you're actually just like letting go and like okay it's done. But like wouldn't you be releasing the weight as well with that? You you are releasing the weight, uh, but basically the idea is that the <clears throat> and this is a loaded term in physics the work that you did to pull that weight up there is now stored and the work will be released once in the form of the weight once it comes down. One thing I thought about doing Nori as a demonstration is let's consider a different type of potential energy that's not gravitational. Here's a spring. Springs kind of have a natural resting point where they're at equilibrium. And there's a law in physics called Hooke's law that tells us that if you stretch a spring, the spring will feel a restoring force 
that's proportional to the amount of st stretch. So if I stretch it this much, I get one or two Newtons. If I stretch it that much, I get five or six Newtons. And if I keep stretching, I get even more Newtons. And what happens, of course, when you stretch a spring is you're storing potential energy. Here, the potential energy is a little easier to see because you can see all the coils of the spring. This is not gravitational potential energy. In fact, it's the restoring force in all the metallic molecules and atoms. This is actually like electromechanical potential energy. It's the electric field between all of the atoms and molecules that are actually storing that energy. But you can kind of see it that all of the coils of the spring are contributing to that restoring force. And once I release my hands, whoosh, the spring snaps back, correct? And it's easy for us to imagine that the energy is stored in all of these little coils. If you think about it, Nori, the case of the kilogram mass being lifted off the ground is actually a lot like this spring, right? And that gravity wants to snap the, the kilogram mass right back to the ground. So when I pull this off the ground, I'm sort of storing, I'm storing the energy in the stretch. But here the stretch isn't of some visible spring, it's in the gravitation, the invisible gravitational field itself. Basically, if you think about a force times a distance, I pushed this kilogram against the desire of gravity. And now gravity's desire is my agent, and I can take it wherever I want and drop it. Why don't we calculate the, the quantity that we just did there? Okay, why don't we calculate that, the magnitude of energy stored? Because we know the formula for potential energy, we can actually, and we know this is a one kilogram test mass, and we could see that I lifted it two meters above my head, we can calculate that energy. The potential energy that we just stored or created well, I don't want to say created, I want to say stored, um, is the mass, one kilogram, times little g, 10 meters per second squared, times two meters. OK, what's going to happen now is I'm going to multiply these together, and I'm going to get 20. Can you guys tell me what the units will be? Jetta, I think we were picking on you the other day with some units, right? We had a little thing where we tried to analyze units together. Did that happen? Yes. All right. So why don't you try out your skills here? See if you can mash all these together into a single set of units, top and bottom. Okay. Would it be kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared? Beautiful. I couldn't have done it better myself. So it's kilograms times meters squared divided by seconds squared. And the way a pro would say that, Jenna, is they would say kilogram meters squared per second squared. It's kind of a lot, right? Now, here's the thing about energy. I know what a kilogram is. I know what a meter and a second are. But when you start to mush all these units together, that starts to sound a bit complicated. I'm not sure I really get what a kilogram meter squared per second squared is. That's sort of tough to think about. This is a good time for us to hide our confusion, to sweep our confusion dust bunnies right under the rug and invent a new unit that sounds easier to say. And that unit is called the joule. That's the MKS unit of energy. So we will redefine this 20 kilogram meter squared per second squared as 20 joules. When I lift this kilogram mass from the ground over my head, I stored 20 joules of energy in the gravitational field of Earth. Um, this is a little fuzzy. Ever since that demo, things have been weird here. Um, I want to do a little tidbit on units of energy because there are many different units that energy can have. So get that down, and I want to I want to do a new thing here. Can I erase? OK. Units of energy. We're going to encounter several different energy units throughout this course, 
and I'd like you guys to be conversant with them, all right? The first one and the most important one is the one that we just learned. It's the MKS unit system of energy. One joule is defined as one kilogram meter squared per second squared. This is the most important unit of energy in our class. Let's think about some other places where we see energy. Um, <clears throat> How about uh, uh, when you pay your electric bill? Anyone paid their national grid bill recently? What do they charge you? Uh, no, Brian's like, no. Uh, well, I have to sometimes, and it's not fun. Uh, does anyone know what units they use for your electric bill? This is going to be in a homework problem, I guess, next week. Anyone remember from my 1020 class? Paul G, I don't know if you took the 1020 class. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, they charge you in kilowatts per hours. Ah, uh -uh. you have to be careful here, bud. It is not kilowatts per hour. If you say per, that means divided by. Your electric bill is kilowatt hours or kilowatts times hour. That's an important distinction. We want to say per sometimes because it sounds easy, but it's kilowatt times hours. Um, one of our homework problems that we were going to do this week, but will be pushed off to next week, is to calculate the number of joules in one kilowatt hour. All right. Uh, how about your gas bill? They charge you in this unit called therms. Check out your gas bill. Look and see where all your money is going. It's going into therms. Um, <clears throat> therms are related to something called British thermal units. If you buy an air conditioner or an oven, they'll sometimes tell you the amount of BTUs it, it costs or pumps out. Uh, I can't remember what the conversion is between therms and BTUs, but that's the kind of thing I should know. Uh, let's see if we can do therms to BTUs. They're not exactly the same. Okay, so a therm is 100,000, uh, basically close to 100,000 BTUs. British thermal units. I just mentioned that because, you know, if you're buying an air conditioner at job lot or something, you'll probably see that. Um, how about the imperial unit? Paul G, do you remember what the imperial units of energy are? Or anyone? No, actually, I don't. Oh, well, you all know this unit. It's called the calorie. In the imperial system uh, of, of units, a calorie is equivalent to 4.2 joules. But this calorie is not, ex it's, it's related to food calories, but it's not exactly the same. For food in the US, we measure food energy in kilocalories or 4,200 joules. Unfortunately, for some reason, I don't know if it was the USDA or what governmental institution decided this, but somewhere along the line, people decided that they should not write kilocalories on food packaging because maybe we'd sound like those snobby Europeans or something. I don't know what the logic was. People just have an irrational hatred of the metric system in the United States. So they foolishly renamed the kilocalorie the calorie, capital C which leads to hideous confusion between the real unit of energy calorie and food calories. Um, <clears throat> we'll analyze a problem with calories in just a second. So the, when you guys measure the energy of food in calories, you're actually measuring them in thousands of calories. 
Um, lastly, we're going to see one uh, next week. It's a tiny microscopic unit of energy that we use for atoms. And in the world of atoms, measuring joules is uh, measuring energies in joules isn't useful because it's so tiny. We use a weird unit called the electron volt. I'm just trying to scare you now and freak out. An electron volt is a tiny unit of energy equivalent to um, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. We're actually going to be using, and, and we sometimes just call them EVs, lowercase e, capital V. These are all different units that energy can be measured in. And the units that people tend to use, it tends to depend on what kind of an application. When you're doing foodstuffs, you lose food calories, electric bills and kilowatts uh, times hours, Paul. And in physics, we tend to use joules, but all of these can be converted to each other. So let's try a little problem. Think of this as maybe a little warm up before we start doing problems today. Uh, I still got some time left in my lecture. Um, let's find out how many calories are in a chicken wing. Okay, I don't know, because I had some chicken wings today, and uh, it's kind of a weird breakfast, but all right. So uh, the number of calories in a chicken wing, can we look this up? I'm like 43 calories. Now, I, I know that it had to be more than this, because I didn't just have like a chicken wing. I had like a teriyaki. I had some teriyaki, teriyaki, and they're coated in sugar. So I'm sure there are more. Oh my God. Wait, is this a serving or is that per wing? 257 calories. Whoa. Holy shit. 1,300 calories for six chicken wings. I think I had about, I mean, these weren't your ordinary chicken wings. They were like, crusted in sesame seeds. They were, they were delicious. They were so good. <laughs> I'm still thinking about those chicken wings. All right. So let's find out. Let's find out just how bad I did this morning. Okay. I'm going to erase this. And let's say that uh, Professor B eats six teriyaki chicken wings for a grand total of, let's call it a thousand calories. Now I'm gonna have to pay for that. I'm gonna have to do some work and burn some energy off so that I don't uh, turn my, what do they call it? The COVID-15 into COVID-30, okay? So I'm gonna need to do some exercise and I need an exercise appropriate for a wimpy physicist such as myself. And I've come up with an idea, the one kilogram squat, okay? What I'm gonna do as my exercise is I'm gonna put this kilogram down on the ground and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna lift it two meters over my head. And that's the only exercise I'm willing to do, okay? So um, let's say that uh, our new unit of exercise, a new unit of energy is called the one kilogram squat, <laughs> okay? And how many joules do you expend when you do a one kilogram squat? You're supposed to know the answer to that. Really? No one knows how many joules it takes to do a one kilogram squat? Why would I expect you to know that? Um, well, I guess you can try and figure it out using the definition of a joule, which would be kilogram. Yep. Meters. Great idea. We did that five minutes ago. Look at your notes. Yeah, sorry. Guys, it's uh, like pouring water into be, a colander here. <laughs> what are we going for with distance? Our uh, uh, the original uh, two meters? You, one kilogram, two meters over your head, just like I did earlier. 20 joules. Thank you. Right? Didn't we calculate that, Ian? Yeah, I forgot to write that part down. <laughs> well, that'll teach you, right? You should write down what I write down, Ian. I think it's a good idea. Especially because pity you when you're doing the exam. If you need to like reference something, you're having these notes could be helpful. All right. 
Okay, so Ian, sounds like you're up for some punishment, okay? Ian, I've got a question for you. How many kilogram squats do I need to burn off those chicken wings? Apologies to any vegans in the house. How would I figure that out, Ian? Oh, um, well, you would just figure out how many times, because so one. You know what this sounds like a job for, Ian? It sounds like a job for that super awesome technique that I um, taught you about that is going to save you on the exam. What's it called again? Nope. For some reason, I'm blanking on the name, but unit conversion. Yeah, dimensional analysis. Yeah, right, okay. Why don't we tackle this, Ian, using our dimensional analysis skills? Um, sure. So that would be... How do we start? Uh, we're converting 20 joules into... No, 1,000 calories into joules. I want us to actually read the steps. Now, I know you don't write things down, so maybe you don't have the steps. Maybe Jenna or someone... Does anyone have steps there? Valentina had them at some point. Who's got the steps? Let's have someone read the steps and then Ian will do the steps. All right, Jenna, hook us up with the first step. Okay, write down the number to convert with units. Beautiful, write down the number to convert. The reason I gave you these steps is so they'll be like a religious mantra. You say it and then you know how to start. Write down the number to convert with its units. What do I write down, Ian? I'm sorry, I got like four hours of sleep last night, so I'm like running on fumes, but- uh... That's okay, that's okay. I know this is stressful. I'm doing this for a reason. You know what's gonna be even more stressful, Ian? When you're doing this by yourself on the test, okay? <laughs> so we have to, sleep or no sleep, we have to be able to do this. I want you to be able to do this, you know, even if you just came out of a combat zone, I want you to be able to do dimensional analysis. So write down the number to convert with its units. What are we trying to convert here, Ian? Just think about the question. You said it earlier. It would be the calories and the joules now, or the other way around. Well, that's what we have to know. We have to know how to begin. Does yeah. anyone uh, want to help out, Ian? Does anyone else see how we should be starting? What should we start with? The thousand calories. That's right, Kim. We should. I'm not done picking on you, Ian. We got to pick on you, okay? All right, so we start, I mean. Ian, was... we have to recognize how to begin. What we're trying to do when we know, we want to find out how many kilogram squats to burn off a thousand calories worth of wings. It's the thousand calories that we're trying to convert, okay? All right, uh, read us step two. Uh, thank you for your assist, Kim. Uh, Jenna, read us step two. Okay, <gasps> multiply by a division bar. Okay, I guess we have to do that one for you. And what's step three, Jenna? Put the units in first to cancel. All right, back to Ian. Ian, step three is put the units in first to cancel. I need you to give me a unit top and bottom. It, it would be calories on top and joules on the bottom, right? Now the step says put the units in first to cancel. But I don't see anything canceling here. A calorie times a yeah. calorie gives on. you calories squared per joule. And this whole thing just got a lot worse. Yeah, just switch them. So, so I'm sorry, say that again? Calories on the bottom. That's right. Ian, you always know what should go on the bottom. What should go on the bottom is whatever you have on the top. That's how they cancel. And you'd like to go to joules. Okay, Jenna, now step three is complete. Jenna, what's step? Uh, Four. Okay, put the numbers in second using our conversion factor. Put the numbers in second using conversion factors. Now, Ian, you need a conversion factor from joules to calories. Now, what I suspect, Ian, because you said you're not writing anything down, is you weren't taking any of those notes. I was, just... I'm writing a lot of stuff down. I just didn't write down the example problem. Oh, okay. You'll yeah. never do that again, right? From now on, you should think of me as like, uh, astronomy Jesus, okay? Would do this in memory of me. Whatever I write down, you should write it down. Uh, do you have a conversion somewhere on your page between joules and calories? Yeah, one calorie is 4.2 joules. Aha, uh -huh. and you but, might- well, we're, doing, we're doing kilocalories. Right, so don't get duped by the FDA there, so. 
So what is it again? Uh, 4,200 duels. And where calorie. does 4,200 go? Uh, on top. Yeah. And what goes in the bottom? The one calorie. Okay, Ian, this converts to joules, so you've done a good job, but I want to know how many kilogram squats. So what are you going to do next? Um, so you would, I mean, I know the number, I just, you would figure out how many, um, just, 20. Use, just use the steps of dimensional analysis. That's all I want you to do. Just take it by the numbers. You've already got step one done. What's step two of dimensional analysis? Um, putting in the units that's or I just multiply by a division bar. Yeah, so. that's, that's how I want you to start thinking. I want you to start thinking oh. in terms of those steps. All right, step three is put the units in first. So now, Ian, give me some units. Uh, jewels on the bottom. Good. And uh, I don't really, oh, yeah, the squats on top. Kilogram squats. Kilogram squats, yeah. Good. I know you've only had four hours of sleep, but we, we're we doing this out of love, Ian. We need you to, we need you to train sleep. I can't trust that you're going to have any more sleep uh, when you take the test than you do today. So well, I definitely will. <laughs> okay. And if it's any consolation, I'm, I got five, so I'm not doing too much better. Yeah. Uh, Jules cancel. Uh, now we need a conversion factor, uh, Ian. Oh, but you uh -huh. didn't break down the example. Does anyone have, oh, actually the conversion factor is on the board. Yes. I was about to say that it's literally right there. Okay. Be... So tell me what numbers top and bottom. Um, one on top and 20 on the bottom. Awesome. Okay, guys, punch them up. Actually, I bet we could do this in our heads, right? Can anyone do this in their heads? That's 4.2 million. Divide by a zero, you get 420,000. Divide four and two by two, you get 210,000. Do you guys see how I did that? Was that magic or did you follow my logic? Cool, Jenna did. Is that, just punch it in to make sure I didn't do anything stupid. Could you just punch it in real quick? All right, fine, I'll do it. You're all too slow. A thousand... That's the same answer I got. Oh, okay, thank you, Ryan, for being my friend. Um, cool. Holy shit. I've gotta do 200,000 kilogram squats. I'm in trouble, guys. I'm in big trouble. That's a lot of squats. Holy shit, maybe I shouldn't have eaten six chicken teriyaki wings for breakfast. I mean, like, try to imagine that you could do one squat per second. How many seconds would that take? 210,000. So let's divide that by 60. That would be 3,500 minutes. Divide by 60 again. That would be 58 straight hours of squats to burn off six teriyaki chicken wings. There is a lot of energy in food. This is why we must be careful in these trying COVID times. Of course, not all of those 1,000 calories need to be squatted away, right? Hell, I probably burn more energy just doing this uh, than picking up a one kilogram mass. I am not a stick person. I have mass myself. So that's the idea behind jumping jacks. You're using energy just doing this. And then some of it goes into your brain power. Some of it goes into autonomic processes, keeping your heartbeat, maintaining a temperature gradient. But still, you can, con do you see why energy is so magical? You can convert from teriyaki wings into kilogram squats. Energy can flow from wings into you Hell, you could power a light bulb with it if you put me on an exercise bike with a little uh, turbine there. I mean, where is it? Uh, I got one of these things, right? You can turn chicken wings into light. Amazing. Um. <clears throat> Before we uh, end class and take break, I want to do like one, one last little module with you guys. I just, there's two little things and then I'm stopping, okay? Um, so I'll try to make this one faster. All of this was started off by considering the potential energy in a kilogram squat. There are other forms of energy and I'll just kind of define them quick. Um, 
Kin kinetic energy. Um, the simple version is the kinetic energy. Usually you have some particle. Maybe it's a bullet or maybe it's a BB. It has some mass. It has a velocity. Your, your BB is traveling through space. And kinetic energy is the energy associated with that moving object. The technical definition, so it's one half mass times velocity squared. It's similar to momentum, but not the same. And we think of it as uh, the technical definition is it's the energy needed to accelerate a mass to a velocity v. That's too wordy for my tastes. It's the energy associated with a moving object. Um, there's a picture I love from, from art and physics history taken by the legendary MIT physicist, Doc Edgerton. He took this beautiful photograph that I have in my slideshow um, of a bullet rupturing an apple. I think it's sort of a cool visual demonstration of kinetic energy. Um, this guy, Doc Edgerton, uh, he, was, he was working before the advent of high-speed cameras and photography. Now some of the stuff they do with high-speed photography, if you've ever seen the show Time Warp, it's really wild to watch them just do the simplest things like drops of water done at super high frame rates. So you can slow them down and watch them go. Um, he did this in the whatever 60s or 70s using strobe lights and he would flash strobe lights while doing photography so he could capture these split second moments. And this is just a, this is a beautiful aesthetic work of art as well as a demonstration of kinetic energy. You can see the bullet rupturing the apple there. Bullets contain a lot of kinetic energy. I'm not going to have us do a calculation because we're almost out of time. I just want to throw it up there. We're going to consider kinetic energy kind of frequently in this class. So we might actually do a calculation with this at some point. Um, another form of energy that's worthy of our considerations is to consider heat and temperature. And I'm going to have to give you the quick and dirty version of this. Oh, wow. I'm totally out of time. You know what? Maybe I'll save that for after the test, OK? So let's take a reminder, because I'm going to forget. Next time, temperature and heat. OK. So we kind of stretched out to some simple topics today, but I hope you had fun. Uh, now it is time for us to get into practice problem mode. Should we take a little pause to maybe drink some tea or coffee? You guys want that break? All right. Yes. Everyone says yes. All right. So 15 minutes. It's 1.35 iPhone time. 36. Uh, so 1.50-ish we begin around then? Okay. All right. I'm going to go see if there's any more chicken wings. OK. Um, are we, I have a quick question. Are we studying for the exam today? Or are we going to be also doing um, homework five? Um, so I've postponed homework five till next uh, week, next okay. Wednesday. OK, and sorry, I missed the beginning of class a little bit, so. Um, Molly, you definitely want to go back and watch the beginning, because in the first, like, 20 minutes of class, mm -hmm. I went over in painstaking detail the exam, the format, what to expect, what days you can take it. So that's okay. really important. And I, I purposely did it at the beginning so you wouldn't have to scroll around to find it, OK? OK, thank you. Um, but uh, Molly, the plan today, as I mentioned earlier, is what we're going to do now is rather than spend time doing a homework, we're going we're gonna to do practice problems for the test. And the problems that I'm going to give you will be quite similar uh, to exam problems. OK. Um, as I mentioned earlier, guys, this has a different feel than a typical homework session. Uh, in the same way that I kind of tortured Ian earlier and I made him go through the steps of dimensional analysis for his own good, we need to try to practice taking the training wheels off and, and riding on our own power, right? 
uh, we need to we need to know if we can solve these problems without me being a tour guide. So, and I want to really encourage the people who are trolling in the background and maybe half watching TV. I don't know what the hell you guys do uh, back there because I can't see you. And I don't know what the people at home do if they even get this far in the videos when they're watching them. But if you are paying attention in any way, you need to try to do this on your own and not just watch the solution. If you watch the solution, it looks so obvious, but you're gonna discover that there are things that are totally not obvious when you're doing it by yourself. So I'm gonna give you a problem. I'm gonna give you, uh, because now listen, the faster you guys work, the more problems I can give you. Eventually we're just gonna get tuckered out and tired. By three o'clock, no one's gonna to wanna to be doing this anymore. And you're probably already tired. Um, the faster we can solve these problems, the more examples I can give you, the better trained you will be for the test. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with one now. Let me figure out what my timer should be. It'll be, I feel like five minutes isn't quite enough time from past experience, but let's start with five minutes and see if you guys can do it. For a longer one, I might give you uh, a little bit more time. Um, here's a problem. Take out a calculator and pencil and a paper. You're gonna to try to set it up. You, do you have your equation sheet? I think if you have your equation sheet handy, that's a good idea. In fact, I'd even recommend printing out a physical copy so that you can just focus on the screen during the test or focus on your page. If you have a physical copy of that formula sheet, that'd be great. Uh, Molly, did you see that? It, uh, can you see the chat log, Molly, since you joined late? Molly, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm in work. That's why I'm, I'm not talking too much. That's OK. I don't want to distract you uh, too much from work. but. In the chat log, I sent the formula sheet to the class. Can you see that even though that you came in late or do I, should I send that again? It's not in the chat log right now. All right, so I'm network disconnect, hold on. Hmm. Why would it? I figured out what the issue was last time. It doesn't, it doesn't like it. Uh, oh, I know, because it's open. That's why. That's what it was. It's because I have the file open. Click, click. OK, let's try that one more time. Yes. Molly, uh, if you look into the chat log, you should see the formula sheet right there. Yep, it just popped up. Beautiful. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, everyone. Here's our first problem. Let's start with, um, <clears throat> maybe let's start with Comet Hayakutake. Just give me a second here. Comet Hayakutake. Okay, there's uh, a legendary comet from the 90s called Hayakutake. And I'm gonna tell you some things about this comet and give you a couple of problems. Uh, let me just look up its eccentricity really quick. Oh, wow. Amazing. And Awesome. Comet Hayakutake is a long period comet. So this will be a sort of easy warm up. Long period comets come from almost outside the solar system. And in the case of Comet Hayakutake, we know that it has a period, I kid you not, of 70,000 years. So if you missed Comet Hayakutake uh, in the 90s, don't worry, you'll get another chance when you're 70,000 years old, okay? And uh, it has an orbital eccentricity. Get ready for this. 0 0.9999. That's about as extreme an eccentricity as you can possibly have. Here's what I want you guys to do. In question one, I'd like you to uh, 
find the semi-major axis of uh, the comet's orbit. Then I'd like you to find the perihelion distance, and I want you to find the aphelion distance. And then I've got an advanced question for you. If the sun was nine times more massive, how uh, how would the period change? And you could even tell me what the new period would be. Okay, this problem should not take you too long. I want you to start to work on it. Uh, you guys can ask me any questions if you're stuck. You can talk to each other if you want to. But in general, we should try to solve this as if we were doing it on our own without help. And then after five minutes or so, I'll walk you through how you should have solved it. Let's, I'll be curious to see how many of you can get all three questions. I'll be impressed if you can do it without my help. So let's get to it. I'll actually try to start my timer to make some sense out of this. I'm going to give you uh, seven minutes, OK? Starting now. I think I might pause during the seven minute thing that will compress the video. So if you're watching at home, you probably should pause the recording, try the problem and then unpause it for the solution. I think that's probably a smart thing to do. There's no reason to have dead air. Ready or not, here I come. All right, <clears throat> it's time for us to talk about the solution. Obviously some of you are still working but we can't take forever. We won't get past one problem. Uh, I just want a little bit of honesty the way Nori was honest with me during the problem there. How many of you, uh, show of hands, got an answer? Uh, Jenna, you got an answer. Did you get all three? Um, I took an educated guess on the third one, but the first cool. one I got. That's good. So you, you tried to get an answer for all three. I'm very impressed, Jenna. Uh, anyone else get an answer to at least one or two of them? Ian got a couple. Ryan got a couple. Uh, uh, Valentina, how'd you do? You got two, Ryan. Awesome. That's good. Valentina, honesty, how did you do? Um, so I kind of got the formulas that I needed to use, but I got stuck on the answer of the first one. Okay, so you knew the formula, but you couldn't execute the formula? I did execute, but I got stuck on where I needed to round it the answer. Well, if you got an answer, that's at least something, because with a multiple choice, you'll kind of get a sense of how to round it. Um, um, how about Kim? I think I got it. Okay, that's good. You got something. And how about in the background there, Ryan and Paul G? Paul G was working, so he sounds like he got something. All right, did you guys see what I mean, though, about it being a little tougher when you're trying to do this on your own? Okay. All right, so that's why we have to try this method. Okay, let's go through it by the numbers. I'll show you how you should have solved it. You were given a period and an eccentricity of a comet. I asked you to find the semi-major axis. There's a legendary formula that we use to relate period to semi-major axis. What is it, class? Who figured out the formula? Uh, P squared equals A cubed. Absolutely. And guys, you, there's a reason why I started with this question. You cannot forget about this formula. You're going to have to use this formula more than any other on the test. You must be able to execute this. And I, you need to know that if you get a period, you can get a distance. If you get a distance, you can get a period. All right, so let's go ahead and solve question one then. 
Uh, by the way, P squared equals A cubed is right on the formula sheet. Probably a good idea uh, for you to be familiar. Where's that thing here? Let me open this up. Uh, a good idea for you guys, in case you didn't see it. Uh, come on. Share screen. Boom. Uh, sorry. Look, I put it in an easy to find spot, right? Right there, Keplerian orbits. Those are the formulas we're gonna need for this problem. Okay, it's important for you guys to realize that the semi-major axis is also the average distance between the planet and the sun. Sometimes I'll phrase it like this, find the semi-major axis. Sometimes I'll phrase it, what's the distance between Neptune and the sun or something, okay? Okay, so A cubed is equal to P squared. Uh, Valentina, were you at least able to solve for A? Like, do you know how to deal with the cube? What do you do with the cube, Valentina? You put the square root. Not square root. The cubic root, it will be? That's right, the cube root. So A is equal to the cubed root, which you indicate with the three of P squared. And then you just do the cubed root of 70,000 years squared. Did you guys know how to execute? So Nori, I don't know if you even got that far, but. <clears throat> no, I did, um, but I'm not in my house right now. So I don't have my calculator. Oh my so, God. Yeah. That's like going to like a knife fight without a knife. Okay, you can't do that. I know, I was aware when I realized halfway through, I was like, oh shit, so. All right, well, for those of you who don't know how to do the P squared equals A cubed thing, watch and learn. 70,000, first we square it, Oop. then we, the cube root is in orange for the backspace key, so we do shift, cube root. Uh, sorry, I'm so sorry, I just hit the cube. That's a student mistake. The cube root, I need to get my focus here. Where's my, where's my Logitech device? Oh, I can't resize that anymore. Let's autofocus this. Uh, sorry, I just made a mistake. I hit the cube because I couldn't see the screen. It's cubed roots. So let's try that again. So 70,000 squared, shift, and there's your cube root. Okay, Valentina doesn't know how to round this. Does anyone know how to round this? What should I round it to? Um, I... Could be wrong, but I rounded it to 1,699. That's four sig figs, too ambitious. You'll never see four sig figs on this test. Okay. Yeah. It will be rounded way harder in the answer key. 1,700? That's right. That's what I want to hear. Two sig figs. Most of the time, the test will either be rounded to two sig figs or in a lot of cases, one sig fig, OK? You will never see four sig figs, Ian. So you need to be prepared. Uh, and if, if the only thing you got stumped on, Valentina, was was the rounding, I'm hoping if you saw, uh, well, first of all, let's write this down. Uh, what are the units? It would be AU, right? That's right. This is a magical formula that pumps out your answer in AUs. It is not unheard of for me to make answer A 1700, answer B 1700, answer C 1700, answer D 1700, but I'll just change all the units. AU, kilometers, meters. And the point is, it doesn't fucking matter what the answer is. What matters is the units. So keep in mind, I could do that to you very easily. But in this case, your answer key would probably look like this. It would probably be, uh, you know, 8,000 AU, uh, 1700, AU, uh, 5 AU, uh, 6.1 times 10 to the third AU. Like, I'll just do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And that's why, Ian, you don't want to be keeping four sig figs. It'll distract you, OK? How do we do the next two problems? How do we do the next problem, I mean? That's question one. Can you find the formula for Perry and F? Union. Okay, and what is that formula? <clears throat> nice and loud, please. Uh, Jenna, yeah. um, 
Perry equals A times one minus E. Okay. And what do we put in for A? 1700. AU times one minus 0.9999. Now to do this, we should use our parentheses keys. I am recording, good, okay. I got paranoid for a second there. Let me autofocus this up close. So 1700 times open parentheses, one minus 0.9999, close parentheses, that's the internal thing, and then you equals. What do you want to round that to this time, Ian? I uh, would just be 0 0.17, right? Because two sig figs there? Yeah, or, I might even, and the answer key even do this. Point 0 0.2. Point two. Shoot, I meant to ask you for answers. That's closer to the sun than the planet Mercury. Um, how about the aphelion? What'd you guys get for the aphelion? It's A times one plus E, which is basically 1700 times. Sometimes, you know, it's good to see the forest for the trees. I would look at that and say, that's kind of like 1700 times two, right? which is 2,000, 3,400. Did you guys see how I did that? I basically argued that's close enough to two where I can multiply 1,700 by two. In fact, this comment is extraordinary. Um, here's a picture of Comet Hayakutake when it passed in 1996. Look how beautiful that is. I don't know if I'll have to get a chance to actually get there. And its orbit goes so bloody far out of the solar system. I was wondering if I could find a model of its orbit. It's It just goes way, oh, wow. It even crosses the ecliptic plane. It's pretty wild. Okay, let's talk about the third problem. Did anyone, you said you took an educated guess um, I would have considered those first two questions wicked easy. They were simple applications of formulas that we used many times. It's not like we didn't do that in homework or in class. And you can get them pretty quick. The third question I thought of as a challenge question. Jenna, you said you made an educated guess. In question three, the sun is replaced by an object with three times the mass. What was your guess about what would happen to the period? Sorry. Not three times the mass, nine times the mass. Apologies. I said that the period would increase. Would, get would what? I said that the period would get longer or increase. That was just a guess. Unfortunately, it's not the right guess. In fact, the opposite is true. Yeah. It's it shorter. If the mass of the star increases, it has more gravity it's going to whip that thing around. Think about the conservation of angular momentum. It's going to speed it up. Does anyone know what the, uh, Paul, anyone in the background get an answer? So I'm not too confident on this one, but I got 0 0.00986 years. No, no. Here's how you should have done this problem. You should have used proportionality arguments. I would have argued P squared and these are things that are tough to do. P squared is proportional to A cubed over the mass. The A hasn't changed, only the mass. So P squared is proportional to one ninth. If P squared is proportional to one ninth, then P is proportional to the square root of one ninth. which is one over the square root of nine. The new period is one third the original period. Take 70,000, divide it by three.
your new answer is 23,000 years. Proportionality arguments. Pay attention to that. Okay. Ready for another? All right. Um, I've got a couple of cue cards here. Uh, uh, just a moment, class. One sec. Okay. In our next problem, we're going to try a geosynchronous satellite. See what you guys can do with this. A geo synch synchronous I hope I spelled that right. Satellite. A geosynchronized satellite has an orbital height of 36,580 kilometers above the surface of Earth. Okay? It has um, a mass of 40. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, Tori. <laughs> <That's what you're laughs> <do. laughs> All right. You're also going to need to know the mass of Earth. Six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. You're going to need to know the radius of Earth, 6,400 kilometers. Given that information, you should be able to solve the following three problems. One, find the period of the satellite. Um, I want you to find it in several different units. I want you to find it in seconds and in hours. I want both answers. Two, I want you to find the force of gravity between Earth and the satellite. Three, find the escape velocity from this orbit. In other words, how fast does the shuttle need to travel if it wants to break away from Earth and go into deep space? OK, that should keep you busy for at least a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you, I don't know if I should give you a full 10 minutes. I'm going to give you eight minutes to work on this. Uh, Nori, you did right to ask me for a hint last time. I could at least get you something to start fiddling with. If any of you cannot start the problem, you should ask me for the hint so I can give you a little push. I don't want you to spend eight minutes doing this, OK? That's not useful. You should be trying something. If you can't even start, you should ask me for a hint. And I'll give you a private hint. OK, I'm actually going to give you nine minutes. Go to it. The time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things. <clears throat> uh, I see you guys furiously uh, working there. It looks like Nori and Jenna are in the throes of it. Are you ready to talk, or do you want to? Keep bashing at it. How do you feel, guys? This is time for me to help you. So I want to do what helps you guys the most. I mean, I've jumped on number two. Like, I, I'm i like debating on like two equations or like two formulas to plug in. But um, on the second one. On number two. Yeah. Well, I would say, Nori, that force of gravity kind of says it all. Right? I'm, I, I guess so, but like, I'm not really sure where to find the second mass. I guess it's from this satellite, but like. It's the force of gravity between the Earth and the satellite. So, yes, one mass is the Earth, the other mass is the satellite. Right? Okay. And I, I did give you both, Nori. 
if you check the board. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you guys feel is best? Do you feel it's best to do go over the solution now or do you want to try to beast at that a little bit longer? I can give you another five minutes. I know this is a tougher kind of problem, but Jenna, what do you think? I think we can go over it. I did it backwards. I did three and then two, so I just didn't finish one, but I'm good to start going over it. Okay. Um, uh, any any other thoughts? Uh, contrary thought? Because Jenna, if you didn't finish one, we could do, we could give you another couple minutes. It'll you know, I just don't know what's you you're ready to to try to solve it. Let me ask this question a different way. Did anybody get the answer to number one? I think I did. But oh, I'm Valentina sure. and Ryan. Hell yeah, my peoples. I like it. Um, how about Nori? How'd you do this time, Nori? I wrote the what I would have put down on the calculator. Um, All right, look, but just, I, uh, Jenna, two more minutes. I want you to punch that into your calculator. You have to, the whole point of question one is you have to try to punch it without me first. Me? I, I don't have mine. Oh, oh right, shit. Well, yeah, go ahead. Phone. You try something, use your phone. It's, you have a phone, right? Yeah. It has a scientific calculator. What, don't you think we should at least try? I mean, I can't, look, if I could jam this thing through the camera into your house, I would do it, but I can't give you a calculator. But you have one on your phone, you could try to do it. So three people got an answer. How about Kim? Kim, where are you at? I want to talk to you individually here. I'm finishing up the uh, velocity. Oh, good. I'm impressed. Uh, people in the background, is there anyone in, in the troll house? Paul G, Ryan? Ryan, how you doing, man? Supposedly there's 15 people in here, but. I mean, I'm still working, but um, we can go over it because I probably messed some things up here. All right, okay. Let's go over it. Ryan, I'm glad you got an answer for one. All right. The first thing I would have done is I would have made a little sketch uh, just, like, just like we did, first of all, I hope you guys realize that this is the same problem we did in lab this week. So if you were there for lab, you should have known how to go about this. You have Earth with a radius of Earth. The satellite is quite high above Earth. The height is 36,580. And of course, you guys know what formula we should use to find the period, right? What formula? P squared equals four times pi squared times A cubed over big G times mass plus mass. And here that's the mass of the earth plus the mass of the satellite. Um, otherwise known as NK3, Newton's version of Kepler's third law. Okay, uh, first thing I would have done is I would have said, all right, the final version has to have the square root on the other side. And now let's do much faster than we did in lab. First thing I do is I recognize that A is the radius of the earth plus the height of the satellite. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna do 6,400 plus 36,580. Oops. Sorry, something happened there. Uh, 6,400 plus 36,580. 42,980 kilometers. You require MKS units. We'll do a unit conversion, 1,000 meters per kilometer should bring us to 42.98 million meters. I don't really need to keep this force. In fact, fuck it, let's make it 43 million meters. Two sig figs are fine. Okay, the mass of the earth plus the mass of the satellite. The mass of the satellite is inconsequential and can be neglected because you are adding them. And therefore, my final calculation should be P is equal to the nice big neat 
square root four times pi squared times 43 million meters cubed. Where are we gonna find big G? It's a formula or it's a constant. It's a constant. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to you right here with its units. That was nice of me. Divided by seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times the mass of earth, six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Everyone, everyone should try to punch this. Even if you didn't get that far, you should try to punch this. In fact, Nori, I'm scared because the whole point of this is to punch it. Um, Valentina, you said you got an answer, didn't you? Yes, I did, but um, the distance, I run the different. That shouldn't matter. Put, what did you, what did you do? Matter. Sorry, Valentina, what did you do for your rounding? I put 4.2 times 10 to the seven. That's okay, but don't you think you should have done 4.3? Yeah. Is 29 cents closer to 30 cents or 20 cents? 30. So you know what? It probably wouldn't have affected your calculation. What did you get for your final answer? I got 83,000 okay. seconds. You are bad at rounding, Valentina. You are very naughty at rounding. Valentina, let's remind ourselves, when we cut a number somewhere, if that number that we get rid of is five or more, we must increment. I bet you got 83,900 or something like that. Oh, I got 83,450. Oh, in that case, you should have left at 83,000. Um, your bad rounding here, though, did affect you just a smidge. Mm -hmm. But you might have been able to pick the correct answer out by looking for the number closest to yours, OK? In any case, uh, Jenna. I got 86,000. Give me three sig figs. OK, 86,400. Nice. And how many hours? Now, that's in units of seconds, right? How many hours is that? Twenty-four hours, so a day. Huh. I guess that's why they call it a geosynchronous satellite, don't they, Jenna? Jenna, if you put a satellite at that height, it will stay over the same point in Earth and rotate along with Earth. That would be really useful for cell phone communications, right? Because you could always bounce your signal off the satellite. It'll stay right over your head. Thus, geosynchronous. It rotates with the Earth. OK, cool. I hope you all, uh, does anyone want to see the punching of that? Yes, you do. Don't lie to me. You want to see, well, some of you clearly got it right. Valentina, you certainly punched it right. I'm going to assume that there are people watching this later who would want to see me punch it just to be on the safe side. I'll do it quickly. Four times pi squared times 43 million shift cube divided by big G, 7 EXP negative 11, divided by the mass of Earth, 6 EXP 24, equals shift square root, 86,400, which, as you know from the Rent musical, is the number of seconds in a day. All right, let's talk about the second problem. Uh, what equation did I want to find the force of gravity between the satellite and the Earth? That would be um, F equals uh, G times mass one times mass two over D squared. Now, in this case, 
we cannot ignore the mass of the satellite because this is a multiplication, right? You can ignore the mass that's smaller if you're adding, but not when you're multiplying. Also, the distance between them is going to be the 43 million meters because it's a center to center distance. And it has to be in MKS units. Seven times 10 to the negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times six times 10 to the 24 kilograms times uh, 40 kilograms divided by 43 million meters squared. Anyone get an answer for that? Jenna, you said you got something, right? Yeah, I just realized I forgot to square the bottom. So okay. I'm just punching it in. Sure. How about uh, Kim or Ryan? I don't know. What'd you guys get? Talk to me. Kim, you said you got something for that, right? Yeah, but I had the wrong number, finishing it up. Okay, um, Ryan? How about Ian? Does anyone want to talk to me? I'm starting to feel lonely over here. Sorry, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking back, I'm going over this with you is helpful because I was doing the D and the A incorrectly. I was just taking the number straight out of it. So that was- Oh, you mean you weren't converting to MKS units? Well, no, it was, I, I had it in meters, but I was doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, like I just took the 36,500 uh, 36, instead of adding it, so. Right, it's, it's center to center distance, remember. In the sense of the force of gravity, Ian, if you have two planets or two moons, it's the center to center distance. Normally the radius of the earth doesn't matter when you're doing something as far away as the sun or the moon, but with a satellite, which is over here, you probably should consider the radius of Earth, right? I think I got it. All right, Jenna, what'd you get? I got 12.3 Newtons. Nice unit work too. I, I object to your three sig figs, 12 Newtons. Yeah, okay. Do you wanna know what's funny about that, Jenna? Do you remember, I don't know if you remember this, we did an in-class problem where we held a one kilogram mass in the gravity of Earth. And you know what's crazy about that? If you analyze it, the force of gravity is m times little g. One kilogram times 10 meters per second squared is 10 newtons, which is about the same answer that you've got, Jenna. Think about this, Jenna. The force that holds that satellite to Earth is the same force, wimpy force, that's tugging on this thing right now. Isn't that crazy that a satellite would be held in orbit by no more than this? Like it's the same force of a brick in your hand. Wild, ain't it? Let's just make sure that she calculated that right, but I'm pretty sure that you did. Um, <clears throat> so seven EXP negative 11 times the mass of earth, six EXP 24 times uh, 40 kilograms divided by 43 million squared equals. And yep, I got 10 when I did it, or I got nine, nine newtons. I don't know where the 12 versus the, the, the nine comes from, but it's, we both got about 10, right? Whatever, that's not important. Oh yeah. I, um, instead of doing 43 times 10 to the six, I did 37 times 10 to the six. I don't know how oh. I got 37. Oh, so it only affected it a little bit, Ian, but like I just said to Ian, you should include the radius of earth, right? Oh yeah. Okay. That's where I did it. So actually my answer was better than yours. Nine newtons. Okay. Um, I did have one question about this because I mean, logically I know what the units are supposed to be. 
but like trying to look at uh, same thing with the first one. I had this problem where when I was going through it, even though I did use You had trouble with the unit balance, right? Yeah. All right. So can you see anything? Let's try to walk through it together. Can you see anything that immediately will cancel out? Yeah. So if I'm remembering this correctly, the meters squared and the uh, meters cubed cancel out to just meters, right? To one meter, right? One, yeah, just, yeah, just me. So this reduces to one meter. What else? Um, I think that one, one of the kilograms on the bottom of, of that will, yeah. So what do we have left then? So it's just. Uh, Tell me everything that's left. Is it just meters times kilogram? You forgot about something. Did I? Yeah, there's something oh, else. the seconds, yes, the seconds, over second squared. Yeah. Now, by the associative law of multiplication, that's the same thing as a kilogram meter per second yeah. squared. And you might have forgotten this, but that's exactly what we defined to be a Newton. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, when I was doing it, it didn't come out clean like that. And I don't know what I like mixed up somewhere, but. Thank you. Um, you got to make sure you keep track of what's on the top of the top, the bottom of the top, the top of the bottom, and the bottom of the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And don't forget per second squareds. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's try the third problem. Unless there's any other questions about this. Third problem was the escape velocity. There's a trick to this, guys. Here's the trick. The escape velocity is normally the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet. But that's assuming that your shuttle is leaving the surface. If your shuttle is higher up in orbit, you have to use the effective radius of kind of an imaginary planet because the gravity is diluted by the fact that the shuttle starts from up here. You actually have to use in your escape velocity, the square root of two times G times the mass over the radius plus the height, because this is the same as leaving an imaginary planet who still has the mass of Earth, but its radius is bigger. I suspect many of you did not know that, all right? So this could be a useful hint. All right. So we already have everything in MKS units. The escape velocity then, let me switch to black for contrast issues, is two times big G meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times the mass of Earth, six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And I've already worked out R plus H in meters, which I need MKS units, divided by 46 million meters. Did anyone actually punch that in and get an answer? I'd love to hear it. So I got 3.6 times 10 to the negative seven. Impossible. Okay. I got 1.3 10 to the negative times 10 to the negative 16. There's no way it can be a negative power because 11 plus 24 is a positive quantity. It's uh, 14, it's 13, 13 divided by six. Oh, I forgot the square root. It. It, no, it doesn't matter. That should still be a positive quantity. You should not have a negative power because negative 11 plus 24 over six 24 minus 11 minus six is like six. And that's before you square root it. Your answer should come out 10 to the three because the square root of six is three. The square root of 10 to the six is three, 10 to the three, excuse me. You know what? You probably didn't follow any of that. Put it in your freaking calculators right, okay? Valentina, you seem to be doing all right today. Excuse me, my run good. It oh. should be 4,400. I got something slightly different. Uh, oh, no, yes. Fuck yeah. Valentina, my girl, you did this. I love it. OK. Um, uh, what are your units, Valentina? You rounded correctly. I'm proud of you. Um, 
kilometers, no, meters over seconds. Nice. Meters per second. Valentina, um, you weren't born in the U.S., I'm guessing. Is that correct? What, so what country are you from? Venezuela. Do you guys use metrics in Venezuela? Yeah. Okay, so this, this is something that should be comfortable for you, right? Yeah. Meters per second. Oh, well, you guys probably use kilometers per hour in your cars, right? Kilometers per hour, yeah. Kilometers per hour. Nice. Not MKS, but metric nonetheless. Um, okay, how many kilometers per second is that? It's customary to convert to kilometers per second. I'm asking anyone. Four point. Oh, yeah? Four point. Sure, go ahead, Ian. 4.4 uh, kilometers per second. Nice. Do you guys uh, remember we talked about the perseverance? Landing, did we watch that at the end of our lab together? Do you know what's, I watched it again afterwards by myself so I could really pay attention. You know what speed the spacecraft was traveling when it hit the atmosphere of Mars? Five kilometers per second. That's what was so pesky about that landing is that thing was already traveling past the escape velocity of Mars. So it had to slow down so that Mars could actually capture it, right? That's why it had to break on the atmosphere. Any questions about that? All right. I want to shift gears a little bit, try some of the earlier problems. How about lost at sea? You guys want to do a lost at sea? I think it would be a good idea for you to practice that. All right, so let's just stop and think about what we've learned so far. What we've learned is it's way harder to do this on your own than when I'm doing it with you, correct? Are you guys getting that picture? However, the other takeaway is that you do have the skills to do this. You just got to find those little places where you would get stuck and we have to unstick you. Little things like forgetting to convert to meters or forgetting what the mass of the satellite is or something, right? So that's why this is a really good exercise. Um, I'm going to erase. Any last questions before I do that? All right. Lost at sea. Okay. I'm going to give you the following information. The date is the fall equinox. The sun has an altitude of 65 degrees in the south. And I, I want to specify not just in the south, directly south. In other words, that's its azimuth. The universal time, the time at Greenwich, England, is 500 hours. Five o'clock, and that's 24 hour time. One, find your latitude. Two, find your longitude. And three, just a fun bonus. You might even use Google Earth for kicks. Where are you? I'm gonna give you the most important hint about lost at sea problems to get you started. Draw a effing diagram.
And you guys know what that diagram looks like, I hope. Be sure to label north and south. Okay, Ryan, go feed them animals. What kind of animals you got? Anything wild and cool? We talking? Um, I got a couple horses, a donkey, and some chickens. No kidding. And some goats. And you don't share videos. We want to, you know, one guy in my class last year, Ryan, had a rooster, and he would sit in the class with the rooster. It was awesome. So wow, you got a whole farm life there. That's cool, buddy. Yep. Uh, uh, well, go go get those animals their food, but you can watch the rest of this later if you want, right? right? Yep. Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I, oh, sorry, I was talking to Ryan there. Sorry, Ryan's bad. Uh, Ryan, you do share your video. One day we want to see those guys. And let me say something else. Uh, the next two questions we're about to do, Lost at Sea and Local Sidereal Time, those can be really rough your first time around. So you right. want to make sure you come back and watch this later, okay? Okay. All right. Have fun with the uh, farm animals. Yep. Have a great day. Okay, guys, I'm going to give you six six minutes to do this because we're gonna start to run out of time here. Oh my God, it's three or five. Yeah, you get, you get five minutes. If you can't do it in five minutes, you can't do it. Okay, let's see where you guys are at and go over this thing, huh? Uh, let me watch that glare. It's pleasantly sunny outside. Okay, how'd you guys do? Did anyone get one or two or both? I think I got one, but I really started blanking out on this. <laughs> yeah, I got one also, but not two. Okay. First of all, let's talk. Do you guys have that intel down? Let's talk about your diagram. The diagram is the key to this problem. Um, if you're not drawing a diagram, you're not doing it right. I would have drawn a diagram like this. Um, I, I'm recording right now. Good. Uh, I would have made a, a 2D local sky. Uh, 10.5. Sorry. Brain no work so good. Quick and dirty local sky. I would have put my boat in the center. And here's the real key. So here are the waves. The real trick is remembering that you got to put north and south on this diagram. Here's the next trick. The next trick is that I told you where the sun was an altitude of 65 degrees in the south. So I would have then put the sun onto my diagram. I would have said, this is 45 degrees. So 55, I'd say 65 is probably somewhere around there. Did anyone understand the significance of the fall equinox? What was the significance of the fall equinox? Why did I have to tell you that? It very much mattered that this is the fall equinox. Okay, Jenna, what'd you get for an answer? Let's try this a different way. I got 25 degrees north for the latitude. Almost, but no cigar. All right, Jenna, what was the significance of the fall equinox? Did you know why well, I had to tell you that? No, I only know the significance of the spring equinox. Ah, uh, remember that the spring equinox and the fall equinox are the same for one important reason. Um, and that is, in both cases, the sun is on the celestial equator. On both, oh, sorry, what the hell? I think I was just sharing my whiteboard with you. Can you see this? 
On both the spring and the fall equinox, the sun is on the celestial equator. That's what the key idea is. So that tells me that this is not just the sun. This is the celestial equator. And that matters because that means, well, we know where the north celestial pole is. Well, we know where one of the poles is. North or south celestial pole is up in this direction. Now, you know that the altitude is 65 degrees. So Jenna, somehow you did get the angle right. You realized that according to our alpha, beta, delta, gamma game, this angle here is your latitude, right? So 90 degrees minus 65 degrees is 25 degrees. Why did you say north, Jenna? Um, I was saying north because I was looking at a practice problem and we it was set up the same way and the answer had north. No. But it was with the spring equinox, so I'm assuming with the fall. No. It doesn't matter if the, there's no way that sample problem had north or I must have been drunk as a skunk that day. Listen, do you put your plants in the southern window or do you put your plants in the northern window of your house? The southern? And why is that? Because you're in the northern hemisphere. If the yeah. sun is in the southern hemisphere, you're in the north. If I went to, what did you see were from Valentina, Argentina? Where, where was it? Venezuela. Oh, Venezuela. I bet growing up in Venezuela, you put your plants in the north windows, didn't you? Venezuela is south of the equator, right? I hope I know what I'm talking about here. Yes. Wait, no. Venezuela is north of the equator. Sorry. Never mind. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> Sorry, South American geography is a little weird for me, you know? Um, <clears throat> It is, oh, sorry. Oh my God, did I just get all screwed up? You had 25 degrees north? Yeah, that's what I had gotten. That's the correct answer, oh my God. I was gonna say, because I also, I think I was looking at the same problem as Jenna and it, it definitely says north. And I was like, oh, okay. I just, I am so sorry, guys. Maybe my blood sugar is getting low, uh, but yes, yes, you're correct. I don't know why I thought you were saying south. I was so sure that I don't even know what the hell I was thinking. Uh, I'm sorry, that was probably just very confusing. We're in the north. This is the North Celestial Pole. You did it completely right. I, Jenna, I think what was happening there is I had the memory of the last time I did this. Someone said south. So I almost like predicted that someone was going to, I don't know what happened. I just got messed up there. I'm sorry. You are correct. It's the chicken. I blame the chicken wings. They went right to my head. Thank you, Naomi. Oh my God. Oh my God, shame on me. All right, yes. Apologies to Jenna and the whole class for that. Obviously, if the sun is in the south, you are in the Northern hemisphere. Jesus. Okay, how about the longitude? Did anybody get that? Yeah, it just, it took me a while to remember the first part. So I was, I didn't really get to look at the second one. Okay. Kim, no one? The, you have to use the time differential. If the sun is on your meridian, what's the local time? That's supposed to secretly tell you the local time. I guess that would mean it. I'm still so embarrassed about that North thing. Jenna, I am so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me there. Um, that would mean it's noon, right? Because it's yeah on the meridian. So 1,200 hours, right? So if the universal time is 500 hours, it's, um, well, we could think of subtracting them in either direction. I would probably do 1,200 minus 500 hours. Um, 
boy, I'm feeling so stupid now that I don't even trust myself to do that in my head. So that's seven hours. And then you guys remember the number to convert it to a degree? If you're seven hours from Greenwich. It's um 15 degrees to an hour. Okay. Seven times 15 is 105 degrees. Okay. Are we, let's try not to screw this up this time. And I'm talking to me here. Is it east or west of the equator? Do you guys know how to do this? I'm sorry, west. east or west of the prime meridian. I apologize. Wow, I'm, I'm starting to lose it here. I need some, I, I was heating up coffee and I forgot to drink it. Um, I think Jeff said it, but I, I also agree that it was west. I think it's east. Is it? Right. So in Rhode Island, Greenwich is late. England is later than us, correct? For instance, if yeah. I were to go yeah, here, right. okay, um, if I were to type in uh, time zones, the world clock shows you the time zones uh, all around the world. Uh, sorry. I like, I don't like the map. I like, sorry. They give you the time in different cities around the, I used to saw the time. Is yeah, no, city? you're definitely right. It's def definitely east because you know, it's typically between 5 a.m. Right. So let me go through my logic and you might have better one. Do you see how it's 8 p.m. in London, but it's 3 p.m. here? London is later than us, right? And we're in Rhode Island, we're west of London, correct? But in this problem, it's the reverse. In this problem, the local time is noon, but it's 500 hours earlier. So that tells me you're 105 degrees east. Does everyone see how I did that? Can I tell you another way that you might do it? If you always subtract universal time minus local time, if it comes out positive, you're west. If it comes out negative, you're east. That's another cool trick. So for instance, had we done 500, sorry, 500 hours, does this work? Minus 12 is negative seven. So that would have said east. Does that help too? All right. Would it be um, universal time minus local time or local time minus universal time? Um, would... I'm quite sure it's universal time minus local time if you want to follow this rule. If you do UT minus local, positive is west and negative is east. You'll notice that I you're probably confused because I reversed it over there. I, I intentionally wanted to make it positive and then I wanted to think my way through it, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it. UT minus local, you can follow this rule. Did, did that make sense what I just said? Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. And just for funs and giggles, if we go to uh, uh, 25 degrees south, 105 degrees east, I wonder if Google will just put us on a map here. Not that we have time for this bullshit, but. Huh, we're in the Indian Ocean. Just near my friend in Australia. Okay. Um, there are more problems that I have. I know you guys are gonna run out of stamina. I'm gonna run out of stamina at some point. I think we should at least do a local sidereal time problem because just like we needed training with this, we should try another local sidereal time problem. I also have more NK3 stuff that we should try. I don't, I want to stop at some point, but I'm willing to keep going if you guys are. All right, let's try local sidereal time. So there is a famous star 
called Arcturus. And Arcturus has a right ascension of 14 hours and 15 minutes. That's all you need to know. Oh, you need to know one other thing. It's currently on the western horizon. That's its current location in the sky. If Arcturus is on your western horizon, one, find the hour angle of Arcturus, two, find the local sidereal time, and three, this is gonna be the challenge question, which point will cross your meridian next? And I'm gonna give you four options. Spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, or the winter solstice. Um, you definitely need to draw a diagram very similar to the one you did before. This diagram, however, should look like this, east and west. Okay, five minutes. Okay, I say we probably should get to it just in the interest of time. Um, <clears throat> This first problem is one where you just kind of have to understand the definition of our angle. Um, I don't know how many people are still with me here. I got four. Who's in the troll house? Oh, there's a few people in the troll house. Um, did anyone get an answer to number one? Nah, nothing, huh? Well, I was confused because in my notes and maybe I forgot to write something down or something, but Basically, I'm what I'm reading is putting me through a loop because I have written down the hour angle of a star is LST minus RA. But then in order to find L, uh, my definition for local sidereal time is hour angle of spring equinox. Okay, uh, yes. At some point, we are going to want to use Ha equals list minus Ra. But we didn't give you the LST. That's the second problem. The idea is you should be able to figure out the hour angle of the star based on where it is in your local sky, just using the definition of our angle. Uh, Jenna, you seem to be pretty good with the notes. Do you want to read us the definition of our angle? Um, our angle is time since meridian. Okay. Yeah, I had that written down, but I couldn't figure out what to do with that, with the information. Well, guys, if you know the hour angle is time since the meridian, you know the hour angle of the star. All right, let me ask you this. Arcturus is a yellow star. I don't have yellow, I have orange. Can you tell me where to put Arcturus on my diagram? Because if you can't do that, then you're probably not gonna be able to do any of this problem. I told um, you where it is. So tell me where to draw Arcturus. I mean, I know it's on the right side because it's in the Western horizon, but I don't- I said it's on the Western horizon. This word means something. I didn't say it was somewhere oh. randomly in the West, Ian. I said it was on your yeah, Western I, horizon. I totally forgot about that for some reason. Yeah, so it's on the West, like where the corner there. Sorry, say it better. Uh, on the, uh, I'm forgetting the term, but it's on the bottom. On the bottom, like the bottom of the board. I, I want to understand you. I'm just not sure um, I do. Uh, Is it zero altitude? Yeah that <laughs> i got an idea draw it uh here you guys can draw on this as well as me right let's clear all drawings well fucking a oh no that's not good enough for me All right. 
Jeez, I gotta get better at this. Just ignore the bottom part. Can you draw on this as well as me? So ignore all this. Show me where the star is. How do I do that? <laughs> you take the, you, you go to, uh, do you don't have a thing that says drawing tools? Do I have to give you permission or can you do that? I have never done this before. So I click on I a little thing that says whiteboard. There's like a little pen tool. I see like mute, stop video, security, participants, new share, pause, whiteboard. Maybe you don't have those controls. I want yeah, to. I don't. Oh. All right, fuck it. I'm just going to show you where it is. This is stupid. It's right here. Yeah, that's what I meant. I just couldn't think of how to say it. <laughs> I mean, Paul said zero degrees altitude. I just wanted to make sure. It, I've seen people do this or this, like it's not even on the sky. So I just don't know what you guys are gonna do. So that's why I get a little jittery, all right? Okay, so Paul, do you know what the hour angle is then? How long has it been since this? You guys know which direction the sky rotates, right? Which direction does the sky rotate? Is it counterclockwise? Not in this case, we're looking south. Jenna, I expect you to know that stars rise in the mm hmm and set in the ha ha. Like, how, how does that go? We're, so it's rotating clockwise. In this case, because we're looking south. One of the reasons I do that, Jenna, I always put east on the left because we're using the clock like a, the sky like a clock. So I want the sky to be rotating clockwise in this case. If I was facing north, it would be counterclockwise, but here I'm facing south. Okay, so what is the time since Arcturus crossed? Where's the meridian? Oh shit, we don't know what our vocabulary words mean. What's meridian? The highest point on the arc. Okay, so right here then, right? Mm -hmm. So how long has it been since Arcturus crossed my meridian? Twelve hours. Sorry, Jenna? Was it 12 hours or six hours? Which one? Can't be both. Six hours. That's right. Because if the star is on the meridian in a quarter of the turn around the sky, it'll be on your western horizon. Therefore, the hour angle by diagram is just six hours. It crossed your meridian six hours ago. Now we can use the equation for number two. LST is ha plus ra. Six hours plus 14, 15 is 10.15. Sorry, whoa, sorry. That was stupid. 20.15, right? How about question three? Does anyone have a clue how you would know what point will cross your meridian next? Yeah, um, I have it in my notes about okay. when, uh, what the right ascension of each one of those is, but also, um, let me see if I can find those. Yeah. So. Um, well, that's not gonna help you here. What's going to help you here is knowing the definition of local sidereal time. That's yeah. what I'm really talking about. What's the definition of local sidereal time? Um, our angle of the spring equinox. That's right. So this LST is the hour angle of the spring equinox. So why don't you tell me where on my sky the spring equinox should be, Ian? Um, if I, I think it should be on like the opposite side of the um, diagram. So like you wouldn't be able to see it. False. 
Okay. <laughs> the sky that you don't see. Let's figure out where 20 hours and 15 minutes is, because that's the hour angle of the spring equinox. Zero, six, 12, 18, 20. The spring equinox will be the next point. Across. Isn't it 4 p.m.? But that's not the question, Kim. Oh, sorry. It, question, the question is, what point will cross your meridian next? If the spring equinox is here, then the fall equinox is over there. Let's see, we have to go counterclockwise. Uh, counterclockwise. Okay, shit, let me be real careful here. Uh, this is rotating the spring, then summer. This will be the summer and that will be the winter, right? The spring equinox is currently in your local sky just above the eastern horizon, and it will be the next point to cross your meridian. So I don't know what the 4 p.m. thing was about, Kim, but I, I wasn't following that. Uh, I, I think you were trying to convert to p.m. time. Don't do that. Stay I think I think it was just in our example problem, so I wasn't sure if it was a given, like a constant, or if that was just from no. our... Our yeah. angle is different depending on the object and depending on the time of day and all that stuff. Our angle is not a constant. The right ascension of a star is constant. That's about it. Okay. I hope you guys are internalizing this stuff. Obviously, it would have been worse if you had done this without any training. At least now you'll have a vague sense of how you should be doing this, right? That's what I'm hoping. Do you want to do one more? Or do you want to stop? What do you want to do? I'm good for one more, but it doesn't matter. All right. I'm good for one more. Yeah. I mean, I'm tired, but I feel like we should do more, one more. We should. I know it sucks, but we should, right? All right. Um, Just a moment. All right, here it goes, guys. This is a little bit of a whopper, but let's end on a bang, okay? Jupiter and Eo. We're not even messing around in this problem. I'm gonna draw the diagram first, okay? On this side is Jupiter. And here's its moon Io. We are observing them from planet Earth some distance away, which is to be determined. I observe Io in my telescope, just like Galileo did, to have an angular separation of 145 arc seconds from the planet Jupiter. Io has an orbital period of 42 hours. That's right from Galileo's notebook. I also know that the synodic period of Jupiter is 1.092 years. Okay. Here's what I want you to do with all of that nonsense. One, convert the angular separation to degrees. Two, convert the period of IO to seconds. Both of those are dimensional analysis. You should have that. Here's where it gets interesting. Three. Find the sidereal period of Jupiter. Four. Find the distance from sun to Jupiter 
then find the distance from Earth to Jupiter. You can assume that Earth, Sun, and Jupiter are all in a row. In other words, you can assume that Jupiter is in opposition. So the Sun is that way. Five, here are the two big ones. Find the orbital radius of Io and then six, find the mass of Jupiter. Honestly, guys, if you get all the way to the end of this, I will be fucking impressed. You have all the skills to do it, but that don't mean that it's gonna be easy. If you take it one step at a time, you can do this. I'm gonna, this will be our last problem, so let's lean into it, okay? Can you guys see everything on the screen? All right. Gonna give you a full 10 minutes for this. See what you can do. How are we doing? I'm a little early, about 30 seconds early. Um, um, in the middle of working on number four. Okay, cool. Do you guys wanna keep beasting it for just a couple more minutes? It is really helpful if you can get all the way to the end. All right, uh, three more minutes, I guess. Okay. What do you say we give this thing a whack? Sure. How are you guys feeling? Um, I felt pretty good up until number five, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to do that. Okay. Let's, I figured... let's take it by the numbers. Uh, my hope, I don't know if this is true, but I was hoping number one and two would be really easy because you guys are really good at dimensional analysis. Is that the truth? Yes. <laughs> okay. So 145 arc seconds. Do you guys know the conversion from arc seconds to degrees or did you do two steps? I did two steps. All right, then we'll do it your way. So arc seconds go to arc minutes, arc minutes to degrees. And it's one over 60 both times. Okay, so that's the same as dividing by 3600, right? 145 divided by 3600. So you got 0 0.04 degrees, correct? Yep. All right. Same thing with converting uh, to seconds. Uh, once again, simple dimensional analysis, 42 hours. Um, just like with the last problem, in one hour, there's 3,600 uh, 3, seconds. So 42, you could have done it in two steps the way we did in the previous problem. So I got 151,000 seconds. That work? All right. If you got questions, now's the time. What'd you do for number three? Could you um, possibly rewrite the first one again? The angle? Yeah. 145 arc seconds times a division bar, arc seconds on bottom, arc minutes on top. The conversion factor is one arc minute is 60 arc seconds times another division bar, arc minutes on bottom, degrees on top. The conversion, which is right in the formula sheet, one degree, 60 arc minutes. If you divide 145, divide by 60, divide by 60, 0 0.04 degrees. Um, did you get screwed up on that somewhere? I don't even know who was talking to me just then. Who was talking to me? Um, it's Nori. I'm sorry that my camera's off right now. My phone's charging. Um, but is that <coughs> no. I I just wanted to write it out properly because I did it like <coughs> my head. I would avoid that. I would put it on paper. Have some scrap paper handy during the exam. But you're cool now, right? Yeah, I'm good now. All right. 
What did you guys use for four, uh, for number three? I use the, uh, it's way earlier in the notes. It's the conversion from uh, sidereal to synodic time for an outer planet. Right, and I just want to demonstrate with a share screen operation that uh, those formulas are here. Which did you choose? Um, I, I did the first one because you're starting with sidereal. Also because Jupiter is an outer planet, right? Okay. So we have um, the sidereal period. Luckily it's already in years for us is 1.092 years over 1.092 years minus one year. What's that give us? Um, you'll, you'll probably would want me to round it more, so I'm going to say 12 years. Um, in this case, I know it's hard to, to get a knock on what I want. I'd actually say 12 years is actually fine. I might have kept 11.9 just for fun. Uh, actually, no, I, I want to take that back. 12 years is the right spirit, okay? That's, that's correct, Ian. Okay, so that's number three checked off. Um, by the way, you might be wondering why I'm quibbling over this. I, I, wanna, I know that any rounding errors are gonna propagate through each step. Since we have so many steps, it makes me wanna keep a little more precision in the intermediate moments, but whatever. Let's go with 12 years. Um, how about question four? What'd you do to get the Sun-Jupiter distance? Um, you can go. Oh, no, I was just going to say, this is where I got confused. I was going to use the small angle formula or the angle separation, but I didn't know what S was. So that's what stumped me. Jenna, we're right back where we started at the beginning of this office hours. A classic formula you must never forget about at all points during this test. Yeah, I was going to say I did P squared equals A cubed. Ian for the win, my man. And you solve for A, right? Yes, I did. And it came out to about 5.2. Um, I don't know if you would want that as five though. Yes, five AU. So Ian, did you figure this part out? What does that make the Earth to Jupiter distance? Um, I had to think about this for a second because I wanted to do the, the Newton formula, but I think actually, isn't it just 5.2 minus one AU? Yeah, because okay. The distance between the sun and earth, don't forget, is one AU. So if it's five AU from sun to Jupiter, earth to Jupiter is just four AU, correct? Sorry. And that means most importantly that this distance here is four AU. Okay, five. Ian, you were doing pretty good up to now and five stumped you. Yeah, um, so I tried to put this into Newton's uh, modification of Kepler's third law. That doesn't come until five. That's how you get the mass. Sorry, six. Okay. Uh, right okay. now you're trying to find the orbital radius of Eo. In other words, you're trying to find this distance here. I thought by drawing this picture for you, it would have suggested the correct formula to use. You know the distance from Earth to Jupiter. You know the angular separation. Oh boy. Um, Come on, is anyone out there capable? You should look at this picture of a long skinny triangle and know exactly what the F I'm talking about. I didn't is this no angular formula? Yes, Valentina, I like your moves, sister. The small angular formula, <laughs> or the small angle formula. Um, S equals theta times D. Did you actually get this far, Valentina? No. Okay, but at least you, you, you contributed. You knew what was up. Remember this thing, guys? You've got the angle in degrees from the previous problem. You got the distance in AU. 
Uh, if I were you, I would probably convert AU. We're eventually going to want this in meters. So you could have done it in a couple of different ways. Um, for AU, we could first convert to um, kilometers. Hell, let's just go all the way to meters. <clears throat> let's see. A buck fifty times two is three dollars. Three dollars times two is six dollars. Six hundred million billion. Six hundred times ten to the nine meters. If you're not cool like me, you can just punch it into your calculator. Okay. And uh, now we'll put this into the small angle formula. What's weird about this problem and what I wanted you to see is in question number five, this distance is S. It's the separation from Jupiter to Io. But in the next problem, it's going to become A in Newton's version of Kepler's third law. So this length can be S in one problem and A in another. Watch out for that. That might throw you guys. So S is... 0 0.04 degrees times, did I do that right? I thought I was being cool there, but let's just check. Four times a buck, 50 million times a thousand. Yeah. So times 600 billion meters times two times pi over 360. exp9 times 2 times pi divided by 360. Oh, nuts. Let's see what we got here. There's the decimal point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 420 times 10 to the 6 meters. All right, how do we find masses in astronomy? There's only one formula that can give you the mass. And what is that formula? I had this discussion with you last class. There is only one formula that you can get the mass from. And what is that formula? NK3. NK3 solved for mass. Did I uh, include the solve for mass version? Uh, if you guys get stumped on algebra, you can ask. Oh, I did. Look, right there, right? We require MKS units. Luckily, you've already converted to MKS in the previous problem. That's why I had you do that so that your numbers would be ready to go. The mass of Jupiter, the mass of Io is irrelevant. Is I'm going to switch to black for contrast issues. Four times pi squared times 420 million meters. You've got to have meters for this. That's why I converted the previous problem to meters cubed over big G, I'm going to leave the units off because I'm feeling kind of lazy, times 151,000 seconds squared. For your last act of goodness, why don't you all punch that into your calculator and make sure you get the same number that I get. One sig fig will suffice. Kim, let's find out what you got.
or Ian, you can tell me. I don't know. Valentina, Jenna, trolls, anyone? Sorry, <clears throat> two or yeah, two. Him, you're forgetting about a really important part of the number. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Can you show me your calculator? Just hold your calculator up. So you can see it. Um, did you not see that there's a power of 31? 32. That's what I have. Well, right, but Kim, hold on a sec. <laughs> Kim, my friend. If you see this, uh, first of all, you, you did something a little wrong, okay? So, but I have a bigger issue that I'm kind of scared about right now. If you see that on your calculator, that's not two. That's two times 10 to the 31 power. You know there's a big difference, right? Yes. Sorry. That's I was... a two followed by 31 zeros. So I don't, you, I'm just scared that you're going to not pay attention to this. And that's the most important part of the number. What's the little dog's name? Luna. Okay, Luna. Luna's going to keep you on task. Every time you forget <laughs> to read the power of your calculator, she's going to bite you in the ankles, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you tell Luna I told her to do that. All right. Okay, um, Kim, you made a slight miscalculation there, but we'll get to the bottom of that. You were off by one two, three, you're off by four orders of magnitude. Oh, we could be off by four orders of magnitude. I don't know, but you might want to punch it again. Uh, anyone else get a different number? Sorry, I'm fading. I'm sure you guys are too. I know this was tough. I got um, more so like 1.8 times 10 to the 27th. So like two times 10 to the 27. Jenna, you did it right. What are the units? Um, Here's a hint, Jenna. Yeah, no, I, I'm just trying to think. Um, what are the units for mass? Kilograms? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Certainly don't want to use uh, cubic liters. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, yes, sorry, I'm being a jerk. Two times 10 to the 27 kilograms. Nicely done, Jenna. Um, Kim? Why don't you follow with me? And I want everyone else to follow with me too. Uh, hey, well, Ian, did you get that? Valentina? Yeah, all right. Um, for Kim's sake, and maybe for the sake of all the people out there at home, let's just check that one more time. Are you ready to follow with me, Kim? Okay, Kim, turn your audio on, dog bark or no. And okay. every time you push the button, I want you to say, okay. So okay. I don't want to go ahead because what happens is if you're looking down and I move forward, you, you get lost. Okay. So every mm -hmm. time I hit a button, I want you to punch that button and I want you to say, okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Four. Yeah. Okay. Times. Yep. Pi. Yep. Squared. Yep. Times. Yep. 420. Yep. EXP six. Yeah. Shift cube key. Yeah. Divide by. Yep. Sorry. Seven. EXP. Yep. Negative 11. Yep. Yeah. Divide by. That's what I did. Yeah. I hit times instead. One, five, one. Zero, 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 square equal. 2.28 to the 10th power. No, no, but look. Yeah. Do you have this? No. Did you hit what? So you, 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 you were doing I the, hit the square key. Then you have to hit equals at the end. Okay. That's what I, I just didn't hit equals. <laughs> right. When you hit square, something happens and it makes you think you're done. Yeah. But all that happened is it just squared it. You have to hit equals to finish the job. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. 
Well, that was a hell of a thing, huh? Guys, there were even more problems, but I think maybe we should stop, right? I think we should stop. I mean, you could try to convince me otherwise. What do you think, Valentina? What does anyone think? I mean, if you think we really should, then yeah, but I also have other work that I need to get done today. All right. Here's the important thing. We went through probably seven problems, five or seven problems. I don't know what it was, but those are problems that you're now gonna have a vague sense on how to do, right? And definitely face it, there were a couple that you would have been totally stumped on, right? So I'd say you're in a better position now than you were before. Definitely, I, I hope so. Remember, if you get really stuck on the test, I'm not above giving you a passive aggressive hint. I reserve the right to make fun of you. That's part of my entertainment, but I will help you if you need it. And all you gotta do is text, call, or email. I don't know if there's something else I should do, but that seems to be everything I can think of, okay? All right. Okay, so I'll try to activate that test late Saturday night so that anyone who wakes up early on Sunday can get at it. Um, and I'll deactivate it Tuesday at midnight. Well, technically Wednesday at midnight, right? All right. I wish you all the best, remember, Stay cool, stay frosty. The nice thing about your crew here is I'm pretty sure all of you have kept up with your homeworks and labs, right? No matter how badly you do on this test, you will still pass the course as long as you're getting in your labs and your homeworks. So I'm not worried about you guys, okay? Obviously we'd like to get the best grade possible, so we should try, but it's okay if it doesn't work out perfect. The journey will teach you something, okay? All right. Well, good luck, and uh, I guess I won't see you on Monday, right? Because I'm not going to really log in or do a Zoom. I'm just going to let you guys work on the test. But I'll be around if you need help. All right. So, so just to double check, we don't have class Monday, and we don't have to submit like our review. This no, is just for practice. Uh, do the test and submit the test. And hold on, I'm going to make sure. I don't overshare here. Uh, share screen. Um, there's a tab called exam. These are hidden from you right now, but this will be active. Uh, on by Sunday, okay? You click it, it'll show you the multiple choice things, do the math on your paper, click the buttons. At the end, you have to submit and that's it. So you do have to submit something, Jenna, you have to submit the multiple choice test. I think I didn't put a time limit on it, so you can work, take as long as you want, okay? All right, and then I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Take care, good luck, call me if you need me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're welcome.